Good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting in 2022 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I would like to remind everyone present to switch their mobile phones to silent. The first item of business is to decide whether to take items 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 in private. Is the committee content to take these items in private? Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item number two, today we are continuing to take evidence on the movable transactions at Scotland Bill across two panels. For our first panel, can I welcome Mike Daly, Solicitor Advocate and Principal Solicitor at the Govan Law Centre, Dr Jonathan Hardman, Convener of the Banking uh, Company and Insolvency Law Subcommittee at the Law Society of Scotland, and Dr Hamish Patrick, Partner and Head of the Financial Sector at Shepherd and Wedderburn. Welcome, uh, gents. Can I remind all attendees, uh, please, not to worry about turning on your microphones uh, during the session, as these are controlled by broadcasting. And if you'd like to come in on any question, can you please just indicate to me by raising your hand? That'd be helpful. Thank you. So, <clears throat> um, with that, we will get started on to the questions. So, first of all, um, just a couple of general questions from, uh, from me before I go on to colleagues. So, apart from the, the issues that you've raised in your submissions, which we will come on to, uh, I'd imagine, in some detail. So, apart from those issues, uh, are you content with uh, the general thrust of the bill? I'll start with yourself. Uh, first of all, Mr Daly. Um, <clears throat> I don't think so, <clears throat> Convener. Um, I think the concern that the Government Law Centre has, and we're very grateful to be invited to give evidence before uh, your committee, is that we're in an unprecedented cost of living crisis. And so I would ask, is this bill needed? And if so, who does it help? And I think the difficulty is, that in our experience as a law centre, the bill would be a bonanza for predatory lenders looking to exploit vulnerable consumers. Now, streamlining benefits and uh, I heard the evidence from the Scottish Law Commission uh, last week which I thought was very helpful so I, I, I can see some of the benefits from a B2B business to business perspective although in saying that I'm not aware of any empirical evidence establishing any real business case for this for businesses I've yet to see that and I should say that although I'm giving my evidence <clears throat> on behalf of the Law Centre I did spend six years representing consumers at the Financial Conduct Authority on their consumer panel and five years uh, as a member of the expert panel of the European Banking Authority. So I come at this as a consumer rep, but also with a knowledge of the financial markets in the UK. OK, well, that, thank you. Um, Dr. Patrick. Yes, I, agree. Yes, I, th I think, contrary to Mike, I think the answer is yes. Uh, um, uh, as I indicate in my uh, um, uh, uh, submission to this, uh, basically we've got post and we need broadband. This is really a technical reform. Uh, uh, it's a matter of, uh, of, of, of legal infrastructure. The legal infrastructure we've got at the moment uh, is, is 19th century. It's, it's completely useless uh, for practical commerce. Uh, I understand the point Mike makes in relation to consumers, and we'll come on to that in more detail, I'm sure. Uh, but there is absolutely no doubt that, uh, that this is of immense benefit to businesses. Um, I spend most of my working life apologising to people in England and the States about how rubbish our law is here. And, oh, we can't do this. We might be able to do this, but it will be very complicated and increase your risk and cost more money, or you can't do it at all. So, um, yes, it is needed. Uh, 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 there may be a question, consumers. The, the uh, uh, major benefit of it is undoubtedly for business. Uh, there may be benefits for consumers as well, and there are obviously risks in relation to consumers, uh, as with anything else uh, uh, new that appears, which we'll, which we'll, which we'll come on to, uh, uh, just because you can now do something on the internet uh, <laughs> that you otherwise had to do manually. Uh, yes, you have to walk, walk, look out for the, 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 the issues that arise around that, uh, but it undoubtedly uh, makes, uh, makes uh, business life uh, better, and we'll be able to do things we can't. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Harden. So the position of the Law Society of Scotland is that reform in this area is needed drastically and, and uh, as soon as possible. Um, and so we support the reforms. We've got some specific comments on aspects of the bill that are included in our submission, but we're very supportive of the reforms in general. 
Great, thank you. Um, just uh, on one other element, uh, which I know one of my colleagues will uh, go into in a bit more detail uh, later, is on the threshold of £1,000. Obviously, the, the report was published, um, initial report by the SLC was published a number of years ago. Um, I'd imagine that uh, that £1,000 was probably fit for that time. Um, would, you, uh, would you want that threshold to be increased? Convener, I, I, um, my, my concern, and uh, again, um, I'm recollecting the evidence from the Scottish Law Commission, and obviously there was a, an empathy, sympathy there about having to uprate that figure. But with the greatest of respect, I don't think consumers should be in this bill at all. I think this bill would be an absolute disaster for consumers in Scotland. So uh, from the point of view of, of Govern Law Centre, um, we would like to see consumers removed from this bill in totality. And no doubt we can explore that further. OK, thank you. Uh, Dr Harden. From the position of the Law Society, um, the, uh, uh, we are concerned about consumers being included in the bill. Um, uh, and I think there are a few different mechanisms to, to reduce them. Uh, one option would be to remove consumers from the bill altogether. The second would be to remove assets that we traditionally associate as being consumer assets, like washing machines and televisions, etc. Or the third would be to increase the amount so that it effectively takes out most consumer amounts, which would cause less damage to the operation of the bill at the moment, uh, but is, as Mike says, a, a rougher metric. OK, thank you. And Dr Patrick? I have really nothing to add to what uh, Dr Hartman uh, uh, says. Um, uh, yes, the, there's no reason not to increase it. Uh, I think the, the focus of the legislation is really elsewhere. Uh, the benefit is really elsewhere. OK, thank you. Uh, so, um, another a few questions. So, first of all, um, Dr Patrick, uh, can you explain how the current law in Scotland affects businesses ability to access finance? It affects different... Well, sorry, to, to, to step back a bit further, this is, bill isn't about finance. This bill is about how you do things legally. Uh, uh, there are lots of things you will be able to do which are nothing to do with finance. The pledges section is about finance because that's a security interest. The assignation section is not. It will be useful when you try to restructure a business, for example, within a group. So it's not all about finance. It's about many, many other things as well. In relation to finance, there are a whole series of different types of finance that are affected by this. Uh, I, I think consumer finance is very much a small element of it, uh, uh, which we may come on to. But the, 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 very, uh, the, the, the immediate impact that people see in it is in relation to invoice discounting. Invoice discounting is basically buying debts. It's a method of financing using your working capital. Uh, it, 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 many of the invoice discounters regard their product as a, a better version of an overdraft, as it were, because it's safer it is, um, uh, for them. <laughs> and as it's safer for them, it has a, a better capital treatment, it's potentially cheaper, and so forth. Now, with invoice discounting at the moment, uh, you have to, you, you cannot basically do it because the, the, the it, as you as you would under the bill, because uh, uh, the 19th century structure requires you to uh, uh, give notice, oh ye, oh ye, style to all of your customers uh, in order to transfer uh, transfer a debt. So it's just it just it just doesn't work. So you have lots of workarounds that are inefficient. Um, questions about how they operate. One of the particular. Uh, and this affects all sectors of the market. This affects uh, uh, very large multinational companies uh, uh, for whom um, uh, uh, Scotland is what they call an in ineligible jurisdiction, i.e. You're, you're, you're financing on the basis of your book debts, uh, your commercial debts uh, throughout Europe or, or globally. Um, Scotland doesn't count. So you get no benefit from uh, uh, your, uh, I don't know whether renewable energy uh, uh, receivables due from companies or something like that. You, 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 the, there are a whole series of things you, uh, uh, that, you, that you wouldn't get benefit for. So Scotland doesn't count. So it would help at that level. At the bottom level uh, in size, and uh, this I think will be uh, an issue to be discussed in the context of consumers because there is a gap between the two. At the moment in Scotland, uh, most of the invoice discounters won't fund sole traders. They'll do it in England, but they don't do it in Scotland. And they don't do it in Scotland because Scots law is inadequate, uh, because individuals cannot grant floating charges, which is the backup mechanism. In England, they don't do that because their law works. Well, it's ugly, but it works, uh, 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 whereas uh, this, this would enable 
uh, uh, sole traders to have access to discounting, uh, uh, which they currently in Scotland, yeah, some will do it, but it's a risky business and uh, the price is, price is higher as a result. Okay, thank you. Yes, Dr Harden. Uh, add to that, um, I agree with what Hamish said there. I think it's important as well to add the benefits for raising finance on corporeal movable items, so things you can touch. Um, because at the moment, if you've got a, a manufacturer with a valuable piece of plant or you know, a shoemaker who has a shoemaking machine that's the most valuable thing within the, in the business, um, you can't use that to, to generate finance. You can't secure that against your finance without de physically delivering it to the creditor and therefore re entirely removing it from the operation of the business. Um, and so Sheep is my favourite. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so the, the, the pledge aspect increases access to finance as well. And so I think there are kind of three areas that um, have been raised in the, uh, um, uh, in the Law Society Banking Company and Insolvency Law Policy Subcommittee um, of areas in which, uh, in which this will help businesses. Firstly, those who currently can't obtain business, uh, finance will be able to obtain finance in the same way as uh, and there's, there are empirical studies linking the ability to grant fixed security to access to finance. Uh, in the same way you can imagine RBS wouldn't lend me money for my flat without the ability to have a standard security against it, the same logic applies. Um, so some businesses who can't currently obtain finance will be able to do so both over their corporeal things you can touch and incorporeal things you can't touch, like claims and intellectual property. Secondly, for those who currently have finance, it will make it cheaper because part of what lenders charge against is, uh, or the rate, way they set their rates in theory, is the profit they want to make, the risk to them of lending the money. And in theory what this does is it reduces the risk element because if the uh, uh, borrower doesn't pay, it gives them further assets they can go against. Um, so it should make existing finance cheaper. And thirdly, there's a concern that the current law is driving people away from using Scots law. So um, people are, are encouraging uh, the use of contracts being written under English law to make them easier to assign. Um, they're encouraging the use of bank accounts based in England to make them easier to take fixed security over. And they're encouraging the incorporation of English subsidiary companies instead of Scottish subsidiary companies to be able to take security over their shares more easily. Um, and these are three areas in which Scots law and Scotland more widely are, are losing out when it doesn't need to. Just on that point, um, before I bring in yourself, Mr Daly, um, just uh, on the, the use of the Scots law and English law, um, do you have any type of, kind of uh, financial um, sum that, that Scotland is losing out on on an annual basis as a consequence of the current law? No, it arises anecdotally, I'm afraid. It's difficult to gauge. As I say, I spend a lot of my practising life saying, put that bank account in England. Hmm. So it's anecdotal, but it is, it is absolutely an everyday occurrence, at, uh, uh, certainly at, say, at, the, at the mid and larger end of the market where, where, where that's possible or practical. Uh, the extent to which uh, it's structured uh, at, the, at the smaller end of the market so that, uh, 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 so that you will find, um, uh, well, you will find um, uh, retail contracts written under English law uh, because it's, 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 it's easier. So this bill would actually stop you from, uh, from having to say that to clients? Uh, yes, yes. In fact, I'll be saying to them, write your stuff under Scots law instead of English law, because we're better than you now. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, Whether they'll do it's another matter, obviously. Uh, sure. 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 Okay. And Mr Daly. Yes, Convener. I, mean, I, I, I fully accept the points that Hamish uh, and <coughs> Jonathan have uh, made in terms of the business Benefits. I can see, and I, I conceded that at the very start, that it's quite clear that there is, there's a streamlining uh, benefit to businesses. But again, I don't see the arguments in terms of the consumer position. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. We are going to come on to uh, a range of questions, uh, so <coughs> we'll come into that also. Uh, just one final question, uh, just on uh, from myself, just regarding the. Um, the, the business to business um, opportunities uh, with this uh, proposed bill. So, with this bill, um, is, do you see any, uh, is there any particular sector of the business community uh, that would uh, primarily uh, be a beneficiary if this bill were to pass? I, th I think all sectors benefit. Now, it, it depends which, like I say, it's a, it's a, it's a very broad technical 
um, uh, structural reform, so all sectors benefit. Uh, as I say, the obvious one is, is invoice discounting, so that's trading businesses with, 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 uh, with, with book debts. Uh, um, the real estate sector, for example, sorry, I'm getting a bit English here, uh, property people, uh, 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 you'll now be able to fund um, uh, student accommodation de development more easily because you'll be able to assign the rents. Uh, if anyone has, 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 has had to advise, will I give all of these students notice uh, of this assignation of rents? Uh, and then they'll not know where to pay it, will they? Um, and when another student comes in, I'll have to do another set of documents to do it. So it'll affect, it'll affect the, the, the property uh, 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 market sh for shopping centres and things like that as well, um, other types of development. Uh, oh, it will affect um, uh, uh, energy, um, uh, 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 both, both renewables and oil and gas. Um, uh, in terms of how they, how they operate their businesses. Uh, um, uh, things like fishing, potentially, depending on whether or not your, uh, your fishing boat is a ship or not. If your fishing boat is not a ship but a boat, <laughs> it will be able to be pledged, which will make life a lot easier in that regard. Technology, uh, once the intellectual property ones are through, um, we'll, we'll be able to uh, do proper security over intellectual property. At the moment, we say, oh, sorry, you can't do very good security over that, or uh, um, uh, maybe you should move to England, uh, or or uh, or the or the US or something like that to to to, to, to do this. Uh, so there's a whole series of of, of sectors. Every sector uh, uh, will be will be benefited in due course, some earlier than others. And I think it will be a gradual realisation of the opportunities that the, the the reforms present to the sectors in order for that for that to be developed. Okay, thank you. Dr. Howden? Yeah, if I, could. I agree with everything Hamish has said. I think intellectual property for technology, startup companies especially, is going to be very, uh, very important. I think a big area as well um, are those that rely on um, having large, valuable assets, like whiskey, for example. You'll be able to pledge your whiskey barrels uh, to a funder and therefore obtain, a whiskey distilleries will be able to obtain finance on their whiskey uh, whilst keeping it in their warehouse, which is something that it's not currently possible to do. Um, which strikes me as a potentially big uh, opportunity. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And anything you'd like to add, Mr Daly? Uh, no, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I'm going to hand over to Oliver. Hi, thank you. Hi, uh, convener. I wanted to ask a couple of questions uh, about uh, assignation um, and kind of principally, um, I guess, whether you see there have been any challenges if assignation is able to occur both by intimation and registration um, and I guess uh, whether you have a view on whether sort of both types of claim might continue. So we're coming around this direction. Uh, I, I, I have no problem with it at all. Uh, there are several reasons for this, uh, one, of, one of which goes back to the breadth of the legislation uh, and, and its potential applications. There are some situations in which the current system works absolutely fine. Uh, 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 or elements of the current system uh, work, uh, work absolutely fine. Uh, things like notice. In, in a lot of circumstances, the requirement to give notice is, is something which stops things happening. On large-scale uh, invoice discounting, you've got hundreds and hundreds of customers um, with, with debts that are due for 30 days. Mm -hmm. Giving them notice every 30 days uh, for hundreds and hundreds of people just isn't going to work. You're doing a large um, uh, project financing, uh, uh, building a building a, uh, a harbour or uh, or, a, or a, a hospital or, or or something like that. You um, uh, uh, you you assign lots of uh, uh, high value limited contracts. Now everyone's there, everyone's in the room, everyone can sign it. Notice is very easy, and in fact, it's probably easier than registration. And sometimes there will be um, commercial sensitivities, so there will be need throughout the variety of uses of this uh, infrastructure uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that mean that one is more advantageous than the other. And I think the disadvantages of that are outweighed. Uh, uh, there are arguments around the register, you won't, the, the register won't be complete. Uh, the register was never going to be complete. The register was never going to be uh, uh, the answer to absolutely everything. The land register works because the land is registered. The assets you assign are not registered, so you, you don't know who owns them to start off with. So, so, so it's never, it, it, the register is, is a completely different thing. The register just tells you that something has happened and puts you in a position to find out what that might be. Now, yes, there may be someone who's given notice that that risk is there, but that's reduced. And in certain fields, I think the practice will develop 
of, uh, of, of everyone registering. And it may be there comes a point where you say, well, actually for those, and the bill pro pro provides for this, for those particular types of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of claim, uh, registration is going to be the only way. And that will obviously improve the, the usefulness in those particular uh, uh, ways of the register. But that's not what the register's for. It's not a land register. So you, you, I, I kind of hear you saying both things there. Yeah. Do, do you... Do you do you think the register will become the default over time? Uh, for a lot of things, yes. Yes. Uh, in actual fact, for some things, people will do both. Uh, if I'm buying a business um, and I'm buying the debts of the business, um, uh, when I close the deal to protect myself from the, from the insolvency of the seller, I will immediately register uh, 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 in the register so that I'm protected from their insolvency. Now, the customers may carry on paying the wrong person, over a period of time, I will probably give notice to them uh, uh, because it's going to work better that way. Equally, there are situations where you wouldn't give notice because it just confuses. You know, if you're doing, if you're if you're transferring um, uh, retail debt, um, you usually carry on paying to the same bank account you paid before because it just confuses people to give them notice. Okay, and and do you? I mean, I guess it's a sort of wider point, but do you think it's important for people to know? You know, as in even for smaller businesses, I think it's important for people to know who they, who they do owe money to. Well, if they pay to the wrong person, they're protected. That's what the notice provisions yeah, are around. But, but do you think it's important for them to know who ultimately they owe money to? Or do you think that's just, that's just how business it's, is done and it doesn't, it's, it doesn't matter? It's, it's, it's how, well, if they could, be, could, could have been notified anyway. Yeah, I, I, there, are, there are certain types of contract where the transfer won't be possible anyway because mm -hmm. the identity of the person to whom you are performing the contract is important and that's preserved by the bill. But and in, there are other situations where it's... In, 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 you think there are situations where it's not important or not, not uh, relevant, I, really? In, in, in many circumstances, I don't think it is important. It, it's not the case at the moment. You would give notice and, yes, yeah. you would find out that you have to pay someone else, uh, but you can't do anything about it. Um, uh, and if you've not got notice, you'll carry on paying the person you were paying before and what they do with the money uh, once they've got it, because it will go to probably a secured account, which will then be passed on to someone else. Thank you. If I, could, if I could just add to that two things. Um, firstly, on the dual approach, I don't think there's an alternative um, because an alternative would be to say the only way to transfer a claim would be to register it in the Registry of Assignations. So that would mean if Hamish showed me £5 and I transferred that to Mike, there wouldn't be any valid transfer unless it was done through the Registry of Assignations. And so you're kind of forcing everybody through a very narrow legal technical approach which isn't going to be the way in which claims are transferred at the lower end of the scale so i don't think there's an alternative uh, really to that and in respect of the is it important who you owe money to i think law traditionally thinks it's more value who owe, it's more important to know who owes you obligations rather than who you owe obligations to on the grounds that if i owe 50 pounds then i owe 50 pounds uh, if the debt can change in terms and that's obviously a different matter um, but uh, uh, and to, to, to follow up uh, with what Hamish says, I think there's probably two differences of approach. One where you're still paying the debt to the same place. So uh, RBS creates loads of uh, loans and assigns them. You're still going to be paying RBS, whoever it ultimately the loan sits with. Um, there, it's probably less important than if you actually physically want the money to transfer. Then there's no way around it other than to tell somebody, don't pay into that bank account, pay into that bank account. Okay. Um, I, I, just before... Um, Mike uh, Daly comes in. I, I just wondered, just sort of pushing back on that a little bit, I guess, you know, I mean, it's strange slightly out of my agreed area question, but for, for consumers or for, for individuals, I mean, I guess, you know, if, if you, you know, the person you, you kind of owe money to, you, you have an idea of how they might treat that debt and how they're going to, to act. And I guess for smaller businesses as well, if, if you think you owe money to, you know, a, a friendly supplier, you know, who you've done business with over a number of years and then the, the person you owe, owe money to changes without you knowing, suddenly you could find you know, the debt being handled differently, I guess. Is that a, a consumer protection issue that arises or is that something we shouldn't worry about? So I think um, at, at the, it's important to note at the moment debts can be transferred. Um, by notice, and so you might you, find out you about would it. Know, and you'd instantly be able to change your your kind of behaviour or approach to, to to how you manage that that debt you within your the business. Was, was changed, <laughs> you know. You, 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 and and yes, there are already uh, um, uh, practices in relation to 
consumer debt uh, 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 promoted by the regulators and the, the, the trade bodies dealing with that. Now, Michael, no doubt, have a view on whether or not they, whether or not they, these these are these are, 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 are good and effective. I mean, there's a bigger issue of whether or not things ought to be transferable at all. Uh, 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 but if they are transferable, I'm not sure that this but, makes a lot of but difference. But this makes it easier for them to be transferred, and it makes it easier for them to be transferred without you knowing. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's you would that's at, at the design. moment at the moment. You do it uh, using the workarounds, using the other, the other. Uh, 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 you have uh, to know trust-based methodologies. No, 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 no. At the moment, at the moment, uh, in invoice discounting, you don't know. It happens economically. Uh, it happens in, in in business terms because there will be a trust and a floating charge uh, for, between the between the, the seller and the and the, and the funder. Uh, so the, the, and the and the funder will have certain controls uh, uh, and, and and be able to step in and enforce. Um, uh, so uh, that would that would carry on. I think people just wouldn't adopt the the, 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 the uh, system. Well, unless of course, unless of course, uh, the transfer itself were restricted, which is a different a different a different issue altogether. And in fact, in that direction, uh, um, uh, uh, legislation as yet. Uh, uh, um, to be implemented in Scotland, uh, I think not for policy reasons, in, in relation to uh, restrictions on transfer of commercial debts, um, is going the other direction to say that you to say that you you uh, you, you cannot impose a restriction on transfer uh, of commercial debt. And Mr. Daly, just to, can, I, can I ask just one point of clarification? You mentioned there regarding the workaround. Uh, also, after all of us uh, question, uh, so with the bill, with that then just put in place. A consistent approach to that transfer, as compared to um, workarounds that which might be different uh, depending on the particular transaction, would that be correct? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, there would be greater right. uniformity. It would be. It would th things would be easier. <laughs> yeah, you see, so the, 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 you would you would follow. Uh, you know, there may be situations where people people would still use the workaround, but it's unlikely. It would have to be uh, uh, if, for example, they were they were operating in several jurisdictions and use the same workaround in some somewhere else uh, for example um, uh, so yeah the, the 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 incentive of things being cheaper and easier will move people towards using the register so it's not just about cheaper and easier it's cheaper easier but also consistent oh yes yes right yes. okay thank you mr daly thank you convener um i, I think mr mundell raises a really important question and oddly enough, I'm actually very sympathetic to what Hamish has just said. I mean, I can think of Govan Law Centre where we have businesses that provide us with supplies. And I've seen the invoice financing from that end. So I, I take on board what Jonathan and Hamish say from the B2B position uh, and the point you, you, you yourself, uh, convener, have made that there's a logic in the bill in making that more effective and streamlined and it's better for Scots law. However, in terms of the consumer, position, I think it's quite to guddle what the bill does, because you need to remember it operates within existing UK law. So under the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000, the Financial Conduct Authority is empowered to make rules, and they've made the uh, consumer credit uh, rule book, which requires any consumer credit uh, agreement to be intimated on assignation to the consumer. So if the bill was passed as drafted, you would then have the kind of quite absurd position that consumers uh, are protected uh, in certain circumstances, but not in others. And that can't be logical. And the final point I'd make is that it's interesting, in terms of Mr Mundell's point, that actually the FCA consider SMEs to be consumers in certain circumstances. So, I mean, I, I, I took from your question a concern about smaller businesses that perhaps don't have the, the, you know, the, the resources of a larger company uh, to kind of handle some of these issues. So I thought that was a really interesting point. Thank you. Um, and then I had a new line of question. Is that, or uh, a uh, new uh, question? Uh, just to kind of one supplement, just on that, can, can you provide some <coughs> examples then, please, Mr Daly? Mm -hmm. uh, you said there regarding uh, consumers protected in some aspects, but not all. Can you provide a, maybe an example of each as to where a consumer would be protected, <coughs> but also one where they wouldn't be? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking... Um, Hamish had mentioned, I think, talked about students' rents, I think you had referenced. Um, so in that regard, in terms of um, 
so, I mean, that's not regulated by the Consumer Credit Act 1974. So, I mean, clearly there, there, there could be some agreement, for example, an agreement that has no interest is not regulated by consumer credit law. So there's a lot of detail in that convener, but the point I'm sort of making is that I just think this creates a kind of a, a very odd position in terms of having UK consumer protection law here and then having the bill coming along. And I, and I, and I fully accept the bill. I mean, I think Hamish had said earlier um, that the bill is not about finance. You know, it's about possession and securities law and Scots law and upgrading the kind of, uh, you know, the spec. I accept that, but what I would say against that is the law doesn't operate in a vacuum. So, you know, the real world is we have the way that businesses operate and we do have the experience of England in that regard, which is why I think from a consumer perspective, um, we've not had bills of sale in Scotland unlike in England. And I think that goes back to Roman law because our Scots law system is based on uh, Roman law, um, which was then replaced by our, our common law. So that's why we never had a non-possessory pledge. And if, if anybody was to say, well, what have the Romans ever done for us? Actually, <laughs> they capped interest at 8% 2,000 years ago. So actually, there's a lot to be said for going back to Roman law. OK. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Oliver. Hey, thank you. I, I, I just leave that point there. Um, the bill uh, would provide for a waiver of defence clause where a debtor agrees with the assigner not to raise uh, defences to payment against the assignee. Uh, are you uh, aware of the waiver of defence clauses being used at present? Um, and do you think there's potential for them to be misused? Waiver of defences, you mean this is in this is in relation to uh, Section 13, is that right? Uh, yes, Section 13.1. Section 13, one, uh, yeah. section 13, well, uh, se se section 13 is, is a section which I think needs completely recast, uh, but that's, a, that's a, for, for technical reasons, because I think it probably has got it. What, what it's trying to do is restate, restate the, 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 the current position of the law. Now, Waiver of defences is, um, is, an, is an interesting question. What you're really talking about here is um, a provision where someone says, um, uh, I will pay you this money, and if you owe me money, I will still pay you it. Or if you haven't performed this other contract, I will still pay you this money. You get two contracts, um, uh, 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 which are unrelated. Uh, uh, one of which involves payment going one direction, and the other involves performance of services going the other direction. Say, uh, um, and if services aren't performed for, performed very well, now that gives rise to a claim for defective performance of of, uh, of, of services. Now, at the moment the person who is due to pay the money cannot say, I'm not going to pay you the money because you didn't fix my car properly. Uh, because un until he has actually crystallised that counterclaim uh, for, for bad fixing of car, uh, uh, he cannot set that off against the payment. He must carry on paying. Uh, when it reaches the stage where it is, where it is, is turned into what they call a liquid claim, i.e., They've gone to court, sort of, and they've gone to the stage where, they, where they, that, that claim is valid uh, or is, is accepted as valid and uh, quantified. They can say, well, I'm not paying your debt to the extent of X, X quid because that's what you owe me the other direction. Now, this is really the law of set-off, which is what Section 13 is about. And you can, in theory, waive set-off so that you can say once, um, once you have not... Uh, when I could otherwise set this liquid claim against this other liquid claim, I agree not to. And that's quite common in some circumstances. Um, uh, no, I should say in, 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 in retail contracts, but it's, it's, it's quite common in certain types of financing uh, agreement. Um, and again, there's a whole spread of types of financing agreement in, in financial markets agreements in particular when doing exactly what you say when you say you're going to do it is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is quite important. So there's a spread where this happens. Um, uh, uh, but I don't think what the bill is trying to do is trying to change 
the current position on this, which has been developed over many years. The, the basic legislation, this is from, from 1592. So, so what, <laughs> um, so what, what, why, why does the bill feel the need to restate it? The bill, the, bill, the bill feels the need to restate it because the, currently the cut-off time for um, for uh, a, a set-off uh, when you do a transfer. OK. Um, you owe me a fiver. I assign it to, 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 uh, to Jonathan. Hold on. <laughs> you owe me a fiver. I owe you, I, I owe you two quid. Uh, 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 and uh, you assign the fiver to Jonathan. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the two quid can be set off against it at that point. At, at the time at which notice is given, and if the two quid uh, uh, um, uh, came into existence after notice, it couldn't be set off normally. There's nuances around that, but it normally, it normally cannot be. So what the bill seeks to do is gone, is gone oh, we've, we've doing something funny with notice uh, uh, of, uh, of assignation. At the moment, notice of assignation has an effect in relation to set off uh, uh, and how defences and counterclaims and so forth operate. We need to do something about that. Uh, and so what they've done is, to my mind, not very well, is, uh, is, is insert, uh, insert a provision which tries to take account of the changes to the, to the, to the way notice operates of assignation under the bill. So that, I think, is all that tries to do. It's just trying to make the existing law, restate the existing law to take account of a change within the bill. Uh, uh, so I don't think, in fact, this is altered. There may be a general, a general policy point as to whether or not the law of set-off should be the way it currently is, um, uh, 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 which is why I suggest in my longer uh, um, uh, response that this should probably be at the Law Commission, uh, uh, that the law of set-off should be the Law Commission, not a restatement of a bit of it in the context of a bill that is partly affected by it. So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bigger question, but it's not something the bill is trying to change. So what, what would you recommend in relation to Section 13, that it comes, so I that think, it comes I think out section, altogether? I, my, I've, suggested, I've suggested uh, in, my, in my longer uh, amendment uh, uh, suggestion that I think it should say, it should say something along the lines um, that uh, you, the law of the different types of set-off will continue as is, provided that uh, uh, um, the effect of notice within the current law will be blah, blah, with reference to the notice provisions in the bill. So there's a, there, there's, uh, and I've tried to set that out in, in, a, in, in a bit more detail. Uh, uh, and I think that's one of the, uh, one of the important <laughs> changes I suggested, because, uh, uh, because if, 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 if that, sort of, that sort of thing is got wrong, um, it creates potentially serious problems in well in financial markets for example if you're if you're if you're uh, if you're um, uh, um, uh, closing out derivatives contracts um, uh, uh, set off is critically important uh, when you're dealing with a derivative contract when prices change change by the minute you know we've yes we've done a swap on sterling uh, 10 days ago uh, uh, and we want to close it out uh, uh, on, uh, on on Friday instead of on Monday um, uh, the timing of set off is quite important in that in that point uh, you know, is there notice and uh, would be the current question okay. supplementary okay Paul thank you convener um, I was interested in the faculty of advocates position who are against the idea of um, waiver of defence clauses because they believe that it would become very quickly established um, practice across all financial institutions and transactions would become pro forma on that basis that um, would diminish the rights of third parties um, and they basically say it's weighing against the protection of small businesses against the marketability of claims would you recognize that as a major risk that behaviorally this could become the norm and thus diminish the ability of Businesses to protect themselves against faulty products that they might have, you know, sought security against. I'm afraid I was so busy seeing Section 13 as being miscast uh, <laughs> that uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't look at that one. I don't have others have views on that. I think these are pretty common clauses anyway in practice, and especially in the business-to-business -business context, um, often referred to as part of your boilerplate clauses. Um, I think there are legitimate questions where you have bargaining disparities. Um, as to whether the, the freedom that people should have contractually to contract out of the default rules for set-off. Um, and I think that some of the um, 
some of the protections that we've looked at outside the business-to-business -business context will help at least alleviate that. Uh, Mr Daly, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, Kirvino. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, you finished, Oliver? Uh, yeah, I'm finished, sorry. No, thank you. Um, Bill Kidd. Yep, um, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, guests, for the um, enlightening uh, discussion so far. Can I ask, uh, I think, a wee bit positive um, aspect of the Bill? How do you think the Bill's provisions on pledges would actually help businesses to access finance? <laughs> uh, there, there is currently, currently uh, well, uh, 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 Jonathan referred to, to, to whisky already, um, and obviously there are varying different types of, 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 of whisky producer. At the moment, uh, you have to jump through various hoops in order to 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 create the equivalent of one of these one of these pledges uh, over over whisky, uh, or over whisky barrels, or or, or or whatever it happens to it happens to be. That's one. Uh, um, uh, there are some situations in which, yeah, like, like that, where it's quite difficult at the moment to do it at all. And uh, sheep as well. Um, I recall as a trainee doing a hire purchase agreement in relation to sheep. Um, uh, this is not a common uh, uh, method of financing sheep, uh, 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 but uh, it, it, it would be useful. I, I'm not joking apart, you know, fish farming is a big industry. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 that, uh, that, uh, how do you go about doing it at the moment? Um, uh, uh, commodities, uh, 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 the, the, the ways you deal with, uh, with, uh, with, 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 with grain or hydrocarbons um, when you're seeking to, to create security over them at the moment are uh, a little bit convoluted and difficult. So, yeah, it's going to be very useful for a lot of people. Right. Thank you. And uh, Mike? Uh, yes, uh, just to provide, to play devil's advocate, if I may, uh, Mr Kidd, to, to what Hamish has said, I accept everything that you said in terms of whiskey, sheep, fish. Um, I always just question, though, you know, how many of those businesses are sole traders, you know, um, which is why I think the discussion the committee had with the Law Commission last week, I can't remember who asked the question, it might have been Mr Balfour, um, about floating charges, you know, because, like, why, why didn't the Law Commission think about extending floating charges? Because it seems to me... And I don't disagree from the business, the business perspective with what Hamish and Jonathan have said. It seems to me we do need to sort all of that out. But I, I, I just sort of throw a caveat in terms of, you know, yes, that's, that's a cogent argument, but it's more in terms of businesses that are more likely to be able to use floating charges, for example. Uh, but I just wanted to throw that into the mix. Okay. <clears throat> Can I come back on that one? Uh, uh, Floating charges for sole traders are, are very difficult because of the method by which you enforce them. Floating charges for partnerships I might have been in favour of. Uh, um, uh, the, the, it was seen as a distraction because of the way floating charges fit in with, with, with Scots law. But for sole traders, this is very useful uh, uh, for, a, for, a, for a, a small agricultural business, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, raising working capital on, 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 on livestock um, or, or, or crops or, or, or whatever. It's a, it's, a, it's a positive benefit. They all have something that they, they can provide to a funder. And then to add in manufacturing again, you know, if you have a, 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 an SME with a valuable piece of kit, that makes whatever they sell, be it gears or, or, or shoes or whatever, um, a bank, a financial institution may only be willing to lend to that, uh, that SME on the basis that if it goes wrong, they can sell that valuable piece of equipment. So they want some preferred right in it. This provides that without having to deliver it to the creditor in order to create it. So that's a, another tangible benefit on it. Thank you very much indeed for that. That's extremely helpful, actually. Um, Something which might not be quite so helpful, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, there are concerns that the statutory pledge provisions in the bill uh, will, or could open up a high-cost lending market in Scotland, and uh, that could target vulnerable consumers. Um, any idea about whether that is a probability or a likelihood? Well, Mr Kidd, I think that is the concern that, that certainly Government Law Centre is coming uh, from. Um, if you think about it, we've, we, we've got the benefit of the experience in the rest of the UK. 
Uh, and of course, the English uh, uh, Law Commission had looked at the Bill of Sale provision, which is kind of what this bill would introduce in Scotland with statutory pledge. Um, and it's interesting that the, the England and Wales Law Commission uh, had did a piece of work looking to reform the position in England. They were, they, I mean, I'm just quoting from the reports. Bills of sale are fraught with problems, both legally and practically. And that included allowing goods to be repossessed on a single default with basically no protection for borrowers. Now, that's what we would introduce if the bill as drafted was passed by this parliament. And it's interesting. I mean, logbook loans has taken off in, in the rest of the UK. Um, and that's effectively um, a non-possessory pledge or bill of sale on a motor vehicle. I think that's what would happen. We already have logbook loans in Scotland, but you don't have to give, go over your loan book to, to, the, to the lender. You effectively get a higher purchase agreement, which has got lots of protection for consumers. And if I could just give a quick example, um, if I can, convener on this very point, because I think it's important. So you borrow £1,000 over three years. I mean, I went online and looked at this. I, did, I never hit the button to actually do it. So £1,000 over three years, the APR that I was quoted online, you know, and I, I'm in Glasgow, all the rest of it, 204.2%. Uh, so it's about £100 a month to pay over um, over that three-year period. I would repay £3,660. Now, let's say I do that on the back of a £1,000 old banger of a car, um, and I miss... I pay my first payment, miss the next, I get into all sorts of difficulty for, for, for all sorts of for, uh, reasons that happen to people in real life. Um, what would happen in, in the real world is that that car of mine would be taken away, it would be sold at an auction under, under the bill. Let's say you get 600 plus quid for it at the auction, because you always get less. I think the Law Commission talks about auctions get the best value. In the real world, people go to these auctions and they know what's going on. Uh, and people get a, a discounted um, uh, deal. So let's say the car gets sold for 600. I'm still due the 3,060 pounds on my loan, uh, plus there'll be the costs of recovery and, and so on and so forth. And I just simply say, why is that benefiting consumers in Scotland? Uh, from the position of the Law Society, um, we very much are concerned about consumers, um, as reflected in our response, uh, and, and think there are some ways we need to protect on that aspect. I do think it's important, though, to, to clarify that the law of debt and the law of security are in, inextricably linked, but separate, um, and that consumer, uh, the lending market should be regulated, and indeed is regulated, um, and loans made in respect to this would fall under that regime. Now, there's an argument for, for changing that and tightening up the protections there, but I suppose at the moment what we have is roadblocks in the access to finance through our security laws, which is like regulating something else by saying, uh, by 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 uh, by, um, by regulating uh, regulating debt by by putting in legal restrictions to people wanting to lend to you. That's perhaps not necessarily the best way to to lend uh, to, to to regulate the market. However, we are very concerned about consumers, as noted. Can I be devil's advocate to Mike then? Uh, uh, back to my sort of uh, modernisation thesis, I suppose. Uh, the, the, you, you, opportunities are provided for innovation and provision of financial services here. In itself, that is a neutral thing. It is how you use the technology that is the bad thing. Uh, there are good new entrants to the to the uh, to the funding market and there are bad new entrants to the funding market there are people providing good products and bad products um, uh, 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 and therefore uh, uh, there is the argument that consumers are deprived of an opportunity for innovation because they will not be able to do things for example <coughs> online now there are clearly risks attached to that if you look for example at um, uh, point of sale finance at the moment point of sale finance uh, the, the clarners of this world so some point of, of sale finance is 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 regulated anyway because it's a it's a consumer loan and then you have the 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 the, the um, uh, deferred uh, purchase price structures which are not currently regulated but the FCA are about to regulate them now should we have banned Klarna in the first place and made it impossible to have that type of deferred structure or 
once that innovation is there, should we regulate it to make sure it operates properly? Similarly, um, uh, think of another example, um, uh, uh, online payment systems, push payment fraud. Uh, if we, uh, big thing, obviously, uh, if, we, if, we, if we didn't have online payment systems available to, uh, to, to individuals, you couldn't have online push payment fraud. So what is the, what is the, is the balance between, uh, uh, between innovation um, and, uh, and, and, and protection, and where do you, and where do you set it? See, so, yeah, I give it a go, mate. <laughs> I'd come back to Hamish on that, because I, I'm very sympathetic to Hamish in terms, of, in terms of his sort of philosophical, what if the world was only wonderful and beautiful? Um, but, but, but there it was. But what I would say to Hamish, um, and, and you know, very interesting point that you raise. Here's the thing. Who are the people that use pawnbroking in Scotland at the moment? And I see them because often they've lost their ticket, you know, to, if they want to reclaim the goods from the pawn shop. So Govan Law Centre does it for free. You need a notary public, and we have to kind of produce a document so people can get their stuff back. We've been doing that for, for decades. Who is it, though, that uses pawnbroking in Scotland? It's people that can't get credit any other way. They've got a really bad credit rating. Credit rating. They are desperate. I mean, I could, I could go touch wood, get a 0% credit card interest today. I could ask my bank for an overdraft. I can get a personal loan at a low rate. For people that are in financial distress and are really vulnerable, they can't do that. So what do they do? Well, traditionally, they've used money lenders, which is illegal. Coming back to Hamish's point, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to use, if this bill is passed, virtual pawnbroking, which is what this bill would do. And all I say to that is, Who's going to be interested in that? Well, predatory lenders are going to be interested in that because the only way you make any money out of this is charge several hundred percent. And I think the Scottish Parliament, and I know that the Scottish Parliament uh, is here to protect the interests of the people of Scotland, and I just simply say this is very dangerous in terms of ordinary members of the public. Um, let's see, there's Jeremy first then, all the supplementaries. Um, Good morning to you all. I mean, just following up that point with you, Mr Daly, if we accept your argument, what, is, what way would you see then taking this out? Would you simply take all individuals out of this bill or would you go over down the other route of saying you can't go against any household goods and define that within a bill plus other areas you might go, or thirdly, would you go for a higher amounts? So we've obviously got a thousand pound balance. Would you raise that to say five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand? I'm just wondering which of the three options, or maybe a fourth option, which you've you've come up with, if we if we accept your argument. I mean, that's a really interesting uh, question, Mr. Blanford, because again, one can one could get into the semantics of some of these arguments about increasing thresholds to high figures, just so that you don't prejudice. You know, Mr. Smith that's got Stratovarius who wants to borrow on the Stratovarius. You know, I mean, that's sometimes the arguments you get wheeled out here. I, I think the easiest and the cleanest and the best solution is just simply taking consumers out. Now, consumers are defined in law in different places. I mean, we've got the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgment Act um, in terms of jurisdiction in, 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 in Scotland, which defines consumers. We've got other bits of legislation that, 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 that... So it's effectively an individual not operating as a trader or in a business function. I fully accept, you know, and I, I think I've probably been more convinced from listening with respect to Jonathan and Hamish that, yes, I can see, particularly I mean, the examples about agricultural... So, I still, yeah, I think I'm convinced I can see the benefit. So you don't want to exclude individual traders... But I think if we use the definition of consumer, we could protect the kind of people that, you know, ordinary members of the public that I'm talking about as against not restricting businesses. Yeah. And can I then ask Mr Hardiman and uh, Dr Patrick, if that was the course of action of Parliament too long term, that we didn't take out individual sole traders, but we took out consumers, what would your response be? to that type of change within the bill? Can I 
First, so, uh, from the Law Society of Scotland perspective, that would protect consumers. I think whichever one of those three metrics you go, you end up slightly over-protecting in some places and risking under-protecting in others. So if you carve out consumers, um, you, uh, um, uh, you over-protect the wealthy consumer who might want to use their assets. Um, if you go down household items, uh, you, uh, you don't protect every consumer, but you protect uh, you might overprotect in certain areas in respect of businesses that use things we think of typically as household items as a um, in the course of business, like a, a laundromat for a washing machine or something. If you carve out washing machines, they can't use what is effectively their, the way they make money. Uh, or if you if you increase the threshold, then um, uh, uh, you uh, um, you overprotect in some areas and underprotect in others. Whichever way you do it, uh, because they're all kind of rough heuristics. I think from the law society's Scotland perspective, any would work to protect consumers. And do the law society of Scotland have a preference to any of those three options? Uh, I would need to speak to our consumer subcommittee about that. We could provide follow-up evidence but in writing if helpful. If you could, that would be helpful. Thank you. And I pretty much with uh, Jonathan on this one, I think. The, 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 as I said earlier, the principal benefits of the reforms are commercial, but there are big benefits uh, for sole traders, so therefore it's important to get that boundary right um, uh, 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 and not and not preclude availability of something that would be would be useful for them. Uh, I'm, I, I can see. I come back to to, to 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 my argument a minute ago that yes, it does it does prevent potential innovation uh, uh, in uh, in uh, 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 retail. Uh, situations, uh, but clearly there's a policy decision to be to be come to as to whether or not the best approach to that is to say you can't do it, rather than here is how it is regulated and here is here is how it is otherwise otherwise uh, uh, restricted. So, uh, well, theoretically, <laughs> and I think the the, the uh, professors uh, uh, Gretton and Stephen said last week uh, uh, that most. Uh, jurisdictions do not exclude consumers. Uh, um, uh, 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 that's my inclination. I can see that the practical arguments uh, may run the other way, and that's not the most important thing, uh, uh, as I see it from the from the from the from the bill. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, okay. Now, Oliver, supplementary. Then back to Bill. Uh, thank you. I was going to ask. I mean, I, I obviously, I'm concerned about pawnbroking too. I see, you know, in my own constituency work, you know, the, the situations that arise out of it. But the <laughs> argument we've sort of heard. From, from others and sort of thing, and it's not necessarily their views, but it's this sort of argument that's put forward that that maybe that, and I think you kind of touched on that yourself, that it's maybe preferential to some of the other finance agreements or f things that are available to people. And I just guess from the Parliament's point of view, it's how we find that balance. And I mean, at the moment for pawnbroking, you have to hand over the item. And we'd heard that one of the potential benefits is that people wouldn't have to hand over, you wouldn't have to hand over the posse possession so your kind of car example, I guess, is you can continue to drive the car or you could continue to use, you know, high value items. You wouldn't have to give them to someone else. Do you think that that is a benefit or do you think, I mean, I guess my own view is it's quite hard to ask people to lend against something that they couldn't live without. You know, I think that's a, or to, to borrow against something they couldn't live without. It's a really important point. And I think what it comes back, I mean, Amy, she talked about it's a policy decision, and I, and I think that I think that's right. But if you think about it, why do we have consumer protection law in the first place? You know, why do we have consumer protection law, which is completely different to say businesses, which is much more laissez-faire. You 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 negotiate freely with your your choice, and it's because you don't have choice. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that people are potentially very vulnerable, and and I would go so far to say that you know if the bill as passed included consumers in the way that it did. I, I, I think, it, not only in terms of all the legal problems, but I actually think there's a morality question to be asked. Because we know from the experience in the rest of the, the UK um, that the only companies that get into this area will be charging several hundred percent APR. And so for me, there's a moral question, there's an ethical question, which is that do we really want our most vulnerable, disadvantaged, you know, fellow citizens in this country to be exposed to that. And what I would say, Mr Wendell, which was very interesting, um, was I remember just a matter of weeks or a couple of months ago, the Scottish Government said publicly, in defending the consumers of being in this bill, and I quote, 
consumers would benefit from these proposals because securing the debt against previously untapped movable assets would generally result in lower interest rates. What I'm saying is all of the evidence says that's not true. I know that the committee has it, got... I mean, I guess the question would be, is it a, a, a lower interest rate than they might get from an unregulated lender? If people are really desperate, you're cutting off any access to finance <laughs> at all. And I guess that's... I mean, I, 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 I'm not yeah. saying I think that's right, but I just wonder, I mean, that's the pushback you kind of get is, well, you'd be taking away the chance to borrow at all, you know, in a regulated market. Well, but it's... Does that raise a question? I mean, if you're desperate for money and you have items you could, you know, I, items you can borrow against at a lower rate than you could get somewhere else. I mean, because people are fine, I guess... <clears throat> My question yeah. would be, I mean, people are finding their own work, I guess, in the way businesses are finding these complex <coughs> workarounds with trusts and access in other jurisdictions. Yeah. Some of the most vulnerable people in our society who don't have access to regulated lending at the moment are finding their own workarounds as well. It's just they're not as, you know, you know they're not necessarily as, you know, I mean, they're... I mean, you've no idea what they're paying in order to borrow that money. And I guess, is it, is it better to move that practice into the light than, than, than leave it unregulated altogether? I guess is. I mean, that's... It, it, in, no, terms I, I the, that, in terms of the morality question, I guess... I no, just, I, I, I fully accept you, you, you do raise a really important point because, for example, companies like, say, Provident and other companies that would come round your door and lend money and have a relationship have disappeared. Um, but at the same time... We do know, and I, I was involved in some work when I was at the, the, the FCA in this, illegal money lending is an absolute evil in, in this country. So you're right to say that, you know, 300% APR with a virtual pawnbroker under this bill is better than an illegal money lender that's going to, you know, come round and, you know, threaten if you don't pay. Um, but we've made that a crime. <laughs> I mean... All I'm we're, saying we're, we're is not, all I'm we're saying not is, very good at identifying it and stopping it. I guess is the question. So, it's, would, is, is, is it better to bring that practice sort of into it, you know, sort of cast some sunlight on it so that we know what's actually happening? Oh, I mean, oh. I, I don't have, you know, I, I don't have a, a no, sort no, of. I, what, what, I mean, what I would say, and, and I'll try and be short, you know, uh, what I would say is, um, we need to do something about it. You're absolutely right. Don't disagree on that. But there's things that we could do. You know, so the, to me, there's there's two options. One is we pass the bill as is and allow this predatory lending to take off in Scotland, and so we become like a page, you know, from a Charles Dickens novel, right? Or we have the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government uh, taking a lead, and they have done great work in terms of, for example, credit unions. We do more. I mean, if you think about it, the Parliament has just published today. The, the Scottish Government's cost of living bill in terms of rent freezes and, and the winter eviction ban. That's the kind of thing that we need in terms of innovative solutions, you know, that can that can make people's lives better. So I, I accept your premise, um, but I think there's a better solution, is the short answer. And sorry, Kevin, that wasn't very short. OK, thank you. I'll take you, Mr Hardman, and then back to Bill Kidd, because uh, I'm just conscious of... Uh, the time that we have thus far. Excellent. I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. I, I think um, we all agree predatory lending is something that needs to be fought against wherever possible. I think the question is, how do you fight it? Do you fight it by regulating the lending market, or do you fight it, as we currently have, by having such out-of-date security laws that nobody wants to lend in, in that situation, um, which might reduce opportunity for, for consumers as well, I suppose. Going back to the point that regulating, while well, security is linked to access to debt, the best way to regulate lending is by regulating lending, not by putting roadblocks in the way for lending in respect of our securities laws. That's what I wanted to add. OK, thank you. Um, Bill. Thank you. And thank you very much indeed um, for the depth of the response there. Um, there's a general agreement, in fact, it's a total agreement, that the £1,000 asset protection threshold for consumer statutory pledges is too low these days. Um, and that's expected that that would be replaced anyway. Um, alternatives for achieving protection for essential household goods, including specifically excluding what are termed ordinary household goods, or creating an index linked accelerator to ensure the threshold is updated. Um, 
is something which I think most people are looking forward to the idea of. Do you have any views on the strengths or weaknesses of these approaches? I think, Mr. Kidd, I've, I've, I've made the position of Governor Centre quite clear. No. So I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to labour the point. But I think I can see if, if the Parliament wasn't minded to take out consumers from the bill, then I'm a pragmatist. I would rather have something than nothing. So I would, <laughs> um, I would accept that that would be better to increase the levels. Okay. Um, the higher, the better. <laughs> if, if that was all that was on offer. I thought it was important to ask yeah. that question so that you yeah. get that through. Thank you. Yeah. From the Law Society of Scotland's perspective, our main drive in this is, is the business-to-business -business world. Um, our consumer committee said they could live with an increased amount. I'll go back to them, as I promised uh, Mr Belfer, uh, to provide written evidence as to which of the three options uh, the consumer committee of the Law Society of Scotland would prefer. And I think Mike's in a better position to comment than I am. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think... I think there, there, are, there are various protective levels and mechanisms in other legislation. There's, there's the, there, are, there are diligence levels uh, and so forth as well. So there's maybe value. And I think there were some attempts to, 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 to match them. So I think there's some value in consistency, so that, to know that, uh, that uh, your, your, your telly and your sofa aren't going to be taken for this. Well, uh, does that, is that not more easily comprehensible? To people, but uh, I, I, I say I've not got the expertise to 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 to, to make much more comment. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeremy. Uh, thank you. If I can just take us back to uh, the law of of recording and the registers in general. I think we dealt with some of this in the opening questions, but just to get a wee bit more on that. Um, uh, it has been stated by some respondents in the evidence that we took that the registers can never be comprehensive. Can you just maybe explain, in, and hopefully in Lehman's language, um, what are the limitations? That'll be me, probably. <laughs> they can never be comprehensive. You can only have a comprehensive register <coughs> if the asset that you're dealing with is registered. So the land register in Scotland is comprehensive because all land is registered or will be at some point in the next God knows how long, uh, registered on the land register with reference to OS maps. So you know, you know what the land is, you know who owns it and all dealings with it must be registered and un unless that is registered there's no dealing. So that, that is the only situation I think in which you can have a register that is comprehensive. Now here we do not know uh, uh, it's very hard to work out who owns, for example, well, cars are a different thing, but you know, who, who owns uh, this table? Uh, 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 um, uh, who owns uh, a piece of intellectual property, uh, um, uh, an invention, unless you've registered it in a register, that's maybe not such a good example. Who owns these sheep? Back to my sheep again. Um, uh, you, you, you cannot tell from a register who owns them. So, so you're starting off from a point of view that the, 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 the foundations are away. Uh, and then you lay on top of that um, uh, the, the practicalities of operating the register. In order to, to, to provide um, a, a comprehensive nature, first of all, you've got to make everyone use it. And we've discussed that already as to, as to some of the disadvantages of, of that being the only way to do things. And there's lots of history there, which we would have to get on the register at some point. So the historical position uh, for long-lasting assets of one sort or another, and there are a lot out there of this nature, um, uh, uh, would always create uncertainty. So, so you would, you would, you, you uh, and when, then when you when you pile on lots of information uh, 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 that you have to provide with your registration, so that people can work out what's going on from the register, um, that creates. Um, um, uh, 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 administration and expense and risk of inaccuracy uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and invalidity for everybody. So I think we've got to be conscious that uh, we don't want to make the best the enemy of the good as far as this register is concerned. If you've got what is basically, they, basically needed, i.e. the identity of the assignee or the identity of the security holder on the register and mechanisms in the bill and in the documents uploaded through which you can find other things out, you know something's there. So therefore you know 
or you know there's something probably there, <laughs> so you can you can uh, you can you can do something about it. It's a lot better than we've got at the moment, uh, where you have haven't the faintest idea. You know, I don't know if the if the if the if this this table is uh, is has been been uh, been hired purchased to the parliamentary body <laughs> or something like that, and I have no way of finding that out. Uh, um, uh, uh, save for an FY request, I suspect. I, I, I wonder if I could just put the question to Mr. Daly in a similar way. Could more from a practical level of when you have clients coming into you and they say, well, uh, do you think you'll be able to search the register enough to get the information? You know, so I may be somebody who is, doesn't remember I've got this or have that debt. Will you be able to find my information by searching the register? Or is, is it something that would just not be something you'll be interested in when coming to advise clients? <clears throat> Well, it may be some. I mean, if, if it came to pass, it may be something that, that, that you would want to check as a money advisor, you know, somebody providing um, uh, advice in terms of um, uh, debt. Um, but I mean, what, I what I would say, Mr. Balfour, is it, it is quite remarkable um, how people who don't have very much actually manage their what very little they have so well. I mean, so you you know, because it's quite important to people, you know, when when you're you're up against the wall financially. So I suppose in some respects, you know, clients that certainly I've acted for um, in, in, in difficult financial circumstances have, they keep their papers, you know, but I, I take your point. It, 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 it certainly could be something that would certainly be useful. Certainly from the business to business point of view, I can see the absolute logic in it from, from a lending perspective. Yeah. I, I, yeah, maybe I could just put this question to you as well, Dr. Harmon, if that's okay. Is, I mean, do you think there will be sufficient information to identify individual claims or pledges? Um, so, um, yes and no is the answer to that. The no's are inherent in the nature of the registers, I think. They'll never prove that a claim existed in the first place, one that was assigned. I could register an assignation of the, of the million pounds Hamish owes me to Mike. It never existed. So searching that, seeing that will never show you the claim existed. Similarly, I could register my cold fusion, a pledge of my cold fusion machine, which again doesn't exist. So the assets don't necessarily exist. Um, even if they do exist, there's nothing to say they still exist later on. Um, and there's nothing to say that they vested in the party that claimed to grant it at the time that they did. And there are some further legal um, limitations on it as well, which is that um, by a, as a matter of law, they can, in a business-to-business -business context, capture future assets. So I can pledge all of my future machines um, falling within a certain category in, in a business context. Um, so when one of those machines comes in, it's automatically covered by law by the pledge, but won't be on the register. Um, and similarly, we can capture generic types of assets, all of which is important for flexibility, but will undermine the searchability of the register. Now, what comparable jurisdictions do, so there's a, a version of this in the US, in New Zealand, in Australia, and um, in Canada, they make the point that this is really a diligence exercise. You can search against a person and see if there is something there. The, that there is doesn't mean that um, there's a, uh, the, that you can take it on its face value. It means you've got to ask the person, OK, well, you've got this, you, this register says this. Can you tell us about it? Oh, that transaction completed, I've repaid the debt, etc., etc. Really a due diligence exercise to help you trigger and ask the questions. Questions that have to be asked anyway at the moment when you're lending, anyone's lending to anybody else, but are asked without that framework to check one aspect against. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's helpful because obviously people may do it and then discharge the debt, but then forget to go back and take it off. So, so that would be a due diligence that would have to be carried out. Yes, and, and it, 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 it operates in slightly different ways. So your register of pledges, in theory, can be discharged. You can say, oh, the pledge yeah. is gone, but you don't have to. But the register of assignations, and a lot of assignations take place in security, they'll just be events. So there's no way to register against an assignation that that has been returned or retrocessed in technical legal language. Okay. You have to do another assignation register to say it's gone back. Um, so that, that, that's a valid point for both registers and they operate in, in slightly different ways. But I would say that doesn't undermine the utility of it as a creation exercise. It will have effects on searching. You'll never be able to search against an asset and prove that it's in the right place or with the right people um, or with the people it claims to be. I don't think that's a limitation. Well, I think it's a limitation, one that's inherent and acceptable uh, and one that perhaps needs a bit of publicity when the registers are launched. Yep, that's helpful. I mean, and so I suppose in regard to it, you know, we're looking at this bill, the Parliament will come to a view in different areas of the bill. Are there improvements 
you think could be made in regard to the registers and how they will work? And do you think there's clarity, or do you think everyone's gone away thinking I've got what I want, and it won't be until it actually works in practice we find out who the winners and losers are? And, and do you think we need more clarity in regard to actually how it will work in practice at this stage? I, I think so. I think there's a, a risk at the moment that the search criteria are, are so all-encompassing that people think they can see things or be able to search things they can't, like... Uh, perhaps car financiers are looking at it thinking I'll be able to search against a chassis number and see if it's covered by the register, which they never will be able to. Um, in part, I think that can be helped by streamlining that provision of the bill to, to actually state what you'll be able to search against and clarify that against that backdrop. Um, in part, I think it could be uh, um, resolved by um, having clear registers guidance when the registers come up and, up and running. But I think at the moment there is that risk, as you say, that people expect different things that might not be achievable. The, the registers are, are obviously developing, registers are obviously developing their system at the moment, and in some ways they are slightly in the dark, I think, because the bill is very broad and the devil is in the SI, which, uh, which uh, uh, will we'll say what should be on it, because at the moment the bill permits all, all sorts of things, um, uh, 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 and I've suggested that the SI shouldn't be too detailed and, 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 and prescriptive, and I've said likewise to registers of Scotland. I think uh, both uh, uh, Jonathan and I have seen uh, um, a, a, an early version of the register that they're, they're developing, and registers are, are engaging uh, uh, with, with, with the stakeholders, which is great, with a view to ensuring that what emerges uh, at the end is going to be what works for people, which I think is important because it's possible to create a monster here, which, which doesn't, which doesn't help anybody, uh, but they're, they're being very positive in doing that. But as I say, they're, in some ways they're slightly in the dark because I think they need a steer <laughs> for, from, uh, for, 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 for some of the detail because the SI could specify just about anything uh, uh, to, go into the, to go into the register. I, and just very quickly, because I appreciate time is going, um, do you think it should be done by statutory instrument or do you think it should be on the face of the bill? Are you happy with an SI that will follow this bill if it's passed? Or would you rather just see it on the face of the bill? We'd be happy with either, from the Law Society's perspective. Yeah. Clearly, the advantage of an SI is that it provides uh, ability to, 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 to change if, if, if what emerges isn't quite right, um, uh, uh, which you know, it wouldn't have been the first time that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, um, um, uh, something had been produced that didn't quite work. Um, but perhaps narrowing down the bill a bit so they knew what they were doing uh, uh, more readily would help. I want to come in, just if I could go on to one other area at the moment, and then, which might be affecting Dr Hardiman in particular. Okay. Yep. Okay. Could that be okay? Uh, if it's brief, thanks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one area I just wanted to pursue before we come back to other areas is in regard to what's not in the bill. Mm -hmm. So obviously the uh, law commission drafted the original bill, which had in stocks and shares. Mm -hmm. The Scottish government have come to a view that that's not got legal competency, and are working with the UK government to see if they can do it um, through a different means. Um, I just was wondering, from, from a law society perspective and maybe from a, a practitioner's perspective, do you think it is legally competent to have this in this bill? And would you prefer it to be done through this bill rather than through an appropriate backdoor method? So uh, we think it's very, very important that shares are included. Um, they must be included. As there's been a couple of legal developments uh, that affect um, companies generally um, that basically make it less likely to uh, or, or, uh, make it less attractive to take a traditional share pledge over shares in a Scottish company. Um, I've written on that elsewhere and can provide written, written further submissions if helpful on that. In respect of the method by which that's achieved, I think we're agnostic so long as it's implemented at the same time as the bill comes in. If the quickest way is to achieve a Section 104 order, I think, uh, then, then, then the Law Society of Scotland would be as happy with that as it would be with it appearing in the bill. We didn't, when the, when the Scottish Law Commission first, we, we didn't look into this in great detail, but when the Scottish Law Commission first produced its draft, we didn't comment that we thought it was outside the competence of, of the Scottish Parliament. Can I appreciate, do you think it is within competence? That would be something I, I would need to look into further details. If you wouldn't mind coming back to us at some point, that would be helpful. 
Well, I'm a practitioner, not a representative of the Law Society. Uh, um, I am also not an expert on legislative competence, um, uh, although I will confess I was surprised when the Scottish Government took the view that it wasn't within the competence of the Parliament to do this. Now, clearly there are various things that overlay uh, uh, um, uh, uh, shares and other securities that are Westminster competence, uh, uh, um, and the, the Commission's bill contained lots of stuff on financial collateral and so forth, designed uh, uh, to fit in with the, uh, the UK financial collateral regime. And absolutely, there would be a, a, an interest uh, 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 of the UK government then to look at that to ensure that what was happening here wasn't causing problems for, uh, for, for financial markets, both for the financial collateral regime and the, and the Crest regime for, uh, for, for uh, dematerialised and, and, and share trading. So, so yes, there are situations. There, there are there's bits where there are sort of sort of dual competence. Although I think uh, you'll be more familiar with this, this than I am, where the where the competence kind of passes each other and one overlays the other. Well, it's like it's like consumer competence. You know, there there's uh, there's the there's CCA competence at Westminster, and there's you can't do it because it's bad for you as a consumer. <laughs> and I think there's sort of dual there, there's 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 this sort of uh, overlap with it mm -hmm. there now. So. Um, as for what I, what, I, what I would say, I, I'm, I can't really take a view because it's for, for, the, for the, 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 the Scottish Government and the parliamentary authorities to take a view on what is competent or not. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Thank you. Do you want to come in on it, Mr Daly? No. No, okay. no convener. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Paul. Thank you, convener. I'm conscious we're up against it in terms of time, so I'll try and be quick on enforcement issues, but obviously are a major concern. I know, um, Mr Daly, you've raised... Um, about Section 63 entitling a creditor to serve a pledge enforcement notice on a debtor if payment has not been made. Section 65 enabling an authorised person, <coughs> aka a sheriff officer, to enter someone's home to remove movable goods subject to a statutory pledge. And Section 66 giving a creditor the right to sell someone's movable goods at public auction. Of course, the main concern being consumers, but also potentially a small business, that critical piece of machinery might shut the business down or something like that. You know, there isn't necessarily the, the, this, the range of protections needed. It could be something as simple as one missed payment could in, trigger an enforcement action. Um, so really, just looking at how the bill needs needing to pre balance protections against unjust enforcement with the needs for the statutory pledge to remain attractive to business lenders, do you think it strikes this balance? Um, just, um, Mr Daly, if you'd like to start. A really, really, really important question, Mr Sweeney, because um, the short answer is I don't think it does. And I, again, that comes back to the, the submissions I've made in relation to the, the reasons why I don't think consumers should be in there. Um, I think you had um, mentioned last week, Mr Sweeney, to the, to the Scottish Law Commission, um, the, the reference to uh, the diligence aspects of the bill in sections 63, 65, 66 been reminiscent of the, the diligence aspects of warrant sales. And I did say that, and, and, I, and, I, and I stand by that, and, I, and I'll explain why, with the greatest of respect uh, to the Scottish Law Commission, um, who, as I recall, uh, were not in favour of abolition of the pendings and warrant sales back in the day. Um, I had drafted uh, that bill for cross-party members back in 1999, Yes, I've been around. And uh, in, um, in that, I, I remember the Scottish Law Commission had actually drafted the SSI to increase the exemptions of goods. So that was their initial position. Um, and the reason I mention the pendings and warrant sales is that what was interesting about that uh, was you never really got that many warrant sales in Scotland. I mean, I think in 99, there was about 500 but you had 23,000 pendings. And it was the threat of that form of diligence that really put the fear of God into people. You know, it, it, it was why this parliament um, voted to abolish and improve consumer protections. Um, I just don't think in the 21st century, being able to go into, you know, being able to apply to the court to, to recover goods within somebody's house, um, is uh, is something we should find acceptable. 
Yeah, if I could just add uh, two things on that. I, I think partially if we if we resolve the consumer issue in respect of the grant of security, that resolves a large chunk of it. Uh, enforcement follows the grant of security, obviously, and so if we if we make sure that those we want to protect are adequately protected at the start, that reduces the need to protect them at the end. Um, and secondly, I think it's worthwhile bearing in mind that once the debt is there, there are existing enforcement mechanisms you can use. Um, you know, if I owe a thousand pounds in respect of a television, um, there are methods in which you know I can I can proceed towards your insolvency. I'm, I don't know much about personal insolvency, but once debt is owed, it's, it needs to be repaid or can be recovered in certain mechanisms anyway. Um, and so that, that just to add those two points to Mike's. Mm. And, and Dr. Patrick? And, uh, not, a, not a huge amount to add. I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 if you have granted a security, you have to have a method by which you realise the asset that is secured. If, you, if you're allowed to grant a security over something in your house, <laughs> then it's not a very good security if you can't enforce it. Um, uh, and sure, protections around enforcement are important, uh, 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 particularly for, 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 for consumers, so that, that needs to be, it needs to be addressed. You know, whether this is actually, actually the return of pending and warrant sales is another matter, and there's various people written all over the place on that as to, as to whether or not it is. You know, the auction is only for the purposes of the, of the creditor buying it themselves. Um, at, uh, uh, so, you know, the, the, I'm not sure that analogy holds, but clearly going into someone's house to get something, uh, even if it's a specific thing that has been secured for the purposes of a debt, is, 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 is an issue. At the moment, of course, you can HP your telly and they can, and they can, uh, they can, uh, they can, they can repossess your telly. So um, I'm not sure that it's radically different from that. Uh, and that may be that, uh, yeah, yeah, clearly there are recovery issues around that. <laughs> it is radically different with respect to Hamish because under the Consumer Credit Act 1974, if a client comes in to me and says, my car's getting repossessed or my big expensive telly is getting repossessed or, uh, or, or HP, um, I have the ability to apply to the court for a Section 129 time order under the 74 Act and I can vary the ability to get a warrant from the court. So basically, I can force the creditor to accept a repayment plan and I can retain possession of the goods, and that includes motor vehicles. So this is another, it's interesting you raise that because I, I, we've covered so many different issues, but it, it does occur to me that in terms of, I do see this if consumers are left in, the obvious route will be motor vehicles. And all I sort of say to the committee is that that we've already got higher purchase in Scotland, which works really well, and it protects consumers uh, with motor vehicles because they can, even if they get into financial difficulty, they can keep their car using Section 129. Um, and indeed, one of my colleagues at Govan Law Centre, um, in Govan Hill Law Centre, part of GLC, um, applied to the court to do that. Uh, and it, it was a very interesting case because the member of the public had applied for what he thought, well, you didn't know about time orders, uh, but you applied for a time to pay direction, which is under the Debt of Scotland Act 1987, which doesn't give you the protection to retain the car, but just gives you time to pay off and you have to give back the car. And he didn't fully appreciate the power that exists in terms of the 74 Act. So we managed to, we managed to kind of save his car. Um, so that, that's my well, retort to that. And fully, and, and fully. <laughs> One could one could amend the enforcement provisions, and, and again, the comment I made was that there may well be CCA amendments that would be sensible to consequentially make it. Although I should say enfor on enforcement more generally, that there is a huge spread of situations where there will be enforcement, and there are, there are situations where where uh, uh, um, uh, 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 quite complicated protections are sensible, and there are situations in where in which in which uh, 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 speed is critical. And once we get shares back in, for example, um, uh, when you want to enforce, when the market is falling, you need to enforce now. And you need to enforce now, and you need to enforce now without having to jump through lots and lots of hoops before you do it. You may be able to fight about it afterwards because you've enforced at the wrong value or something, but mm. there's a spread. And I think that, that is, is addressed in the bill, and I think it's important to remember that and not focus, so focus only on consumers, because I think the benefit of this is, is, is principally for businesses. Um, just to, to build on the point made by Mr Daly, um, you know, looking at Section 64, um, 
even if an individual consumer could agree uh, with the, the creditor that a court order wasn't necessary and thus could actually bypass the protections even of a court. Um, even then, uh, looking at um, the issue where it has been noted by other respondents to the consultation that where a court order may be required before enforcement against a consumer, there are no obvious powers for a sheriff to rely on providing protection. Um, section 62 would allow enforcement against a pledge item if there had been a failure to perform the secured obligation, which is obviously wildly open to interpretation. Um, and to the point about the 74 Consumer Credit Act, um, it doesn't seem clear that there are protections within that which would provide protection in relation to specific enforcement. So, based on those points made, um, you know, where a consumer has breached the terms of a secured loan, it is not clear. Uh, what arguments they could use in court if they even got to court to persuade a sheriff to stop enforcement action. So do you have any particular views on how we actually enhance that provision within the bill um, and what we could rely on in terms of consumer protection legislation more generally um, that could be referenced in the bill as a, as a, as a kind of safeguard? Well, I, mean, risk of, I mean, again, the risk of repetition. I mean, um, I think I've, I've set out the case which is the easiest thing to do is just remove consumers altogether. Um, and I do think there's a very powerful case for doing that and for the reasons that I've set out. Uh, but if the Parliament wasn't minded to do that, then obviously, yes, you, you would want to increase those protections. I mean, I'm conscious it's, it's quite interesting because when you pay a certain amount under the Consumer Credit Act 1974, um, it then becomes necessary under that act for the creditor to apply to the sheriff in order to be able to come and recover your car. But you have to pay a certain amount. Interestingly, there is some Scottish common law, so there's some Scots common law that says you could never recover at common law in terms of you just go around and get somebody's car. And what's interesting, in, interesting about this bill is that for sole traders, so let's say we've got a taxi driver who wants to raise money in terms of a statutory pledge in terms of their their motor vehicle, my understanding of the way it is drafted is that if they get into a default situation, then somebody can just come around and just take the car. Um, and obviously they would need the keys. But I, they don't need a court order, I think I'm right in saying, under the, the, the bill as drafted as a sole trader. I think that's right. Yeah. So um, that, I mean, I, I think we talked to earlier, I think Mr Mandel had the, kind of raised the issue about SMEs. So I just think, just even from, from a point of view of, you know, sole traders, do we need a bit more protection? I would argue yes. That's very helpful. Is there any other points that the gentleman would like to make? Um... Uh, there are some protections already in there for individuals. They're, they're, they're weak and they need, they need strengthened um, uh, on the lines we've talked about. But there are, there are differences for, for, for individuals than, uh, 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 than sole trade, well, for the consumer aspect. So you've got to specific, specifically list your assets. So it, you lose the flexibility to have categories of assets, which is going to be more in the corporate lens. Um, these will be securities under the Consumer Credit Act. And so uh, whilst you have issues as to whether the Consumer Credit Act protects enough, nevertheless, you fall within that, uh, within that regime and the court order, of course, being required to do that. A final thing worth noting is that under Section 62.4, um, creditors enforcing must conform to reasonable standards of commercial practice. And therefore, anything that's deemed by a court to be unreasonable in commercial practice in respect of hooking your goods is going to be something that, that lend, a lender is going to breach a duty in respect of. So there are protections in there, but I think overall, the message I think that the three of us seem to be united on is if we resolve who can grant the securities and what they can grant the statutory pledge over, other things fall into line. Mm. Can I ask like a quick supplementary? Sure. Th thanks. It was an interesting point. It was raised about legislative competence. I was just thinking out, you know, thinking internally as this conversation has developed over the, this morning about interest rates. And you mentioned obviously, this, you know, the Roman cap on eight percent. Mm. I don't know if it's legislative competence to put a provision in the bill where you could cap a maximum APR that could be charged in relation to any form of security. I, I think. Uh, I think, and, and with deep regret, <laughs> I, I think that would be reserved because yeah. it, I mean it would be getting into um, well certainly fine in terms of finance and consumer credit it's clearly Scotland at 1998 um, schedule five um, yeah I, I mean much that I would like to argue um, you know I mean I think at one point when we were trying to do something before the FCA acted for payday loans in fact I'd worked I'd been working with the late Margot Macdonald on this 
because Margot had sort of said, what are we going to do with these payday lenders? And we couldn't do what you've talked about, but we did think about potentially licensing, you know, because licensing is is devolved. So we, we were hatching a plan uh, <laughs> on that basis. But then the FCA came in and um, sorted things out in terms of payday lending. It's an interesting potential around the idea of licensing, though, in order to, yep. to provide this service product to, to the Scottish market. Though. There was a question, uh, I think, as to whether or not that's competent as well in, right. in, the, in, the, in the financial sector. It's FSME stuff, so I think mm. probably not is the answer to that. But there are protections on extortionate credit transactions that yeah. you can challenge transactions if somebody becomes insolvent. You've got to wait until insolvency, but you can challenge them. Um, again, I think um, restrictions on debt are best restricting debt rather than necessarily be inherently linked to the security rights associated with them would be my personal view on that. I mean, I, I think just to, if I can make a brief point, it's just the point, for example, you know, if you wanted to buy a telly from John Lewis, you would get 0% over 24 months. It's an obvious incentive for you to make the transaction and they get the, they get the sale um, and it's a patient way of financing it for yourself because, you know, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, a, a good that will last a long period of time. Um, it seems absurd, you know, in the face of it, it wouldn't seem a problem. You know, if I want to go on holiday, I can stake a thousand pounds against my telly and go off on holiday and pay it off over for 24 months, and I've got a free money basically to finance something that I want to do in a whim. But obviously, if you've got this interest rate liability, then that's clearly going to be targeted towards people who are financially distressed and are much more desperate in need of the money charged at such a, you know, such an onerous rate of interest. Yeah. So it just seems like it will be inevitably targeted at people who have no other avenue to access cheap finance. I, I th I, it's easier, you know, for the because because uh, I, 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 it's it strikes me that the that uh, a lot of the mainstream lenders will use it as well, uh, and you know they, they, why why wouldn't they if it was if it was uh, if it was um, more more convenient? Actually, you may find that your that your licensed pawnbrokers, to the extent that they can do it in the in the, in the bill, will, will do it, and they'll be able, they'll be able to find their pawn receipt because you're because it'll be because it'll be online somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I, no, I, I, th I think I think you're absolutely right. I, th I think, um, yeah, um, the, the if you think about it in terms of mainstream financial services, um, we've got a very very you know robust market in the UK, and you know consumers and indeed businesses um, can access all sorts of different products. Uh, unless they've got a really bad credit rating, that's where it disappears off the cliff edge. Um, and I think that's the point you're raising, Mr Sweeney, which is that in a consumer perspective world, um, where is the incentive you know, for any lender to make money out of this for, from consumers? And the only way it's done, and it's not just me doing this as a hypothetical, because this is what's happened in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, you know, uh, whereas the predatory lenders will come in and the only way they can make money out of this is by charging hundreds of you know, percent APR and that's how they that's how they that's how they make money, um, you know. And so that's not a benefit to anybody apart from predatory lenders. Mm. Um, so before we uh, we close the session, um, do colleagues have any final questions? A uh, very brief final. Yeah, questions. yeah. I, I appreciate, it, and, and I don't want to open a tin of worms, um, but as we heard last week from the commission, these, this type of legislation comes round once in a generation, however you want to define generation. It doesn't come around very often. Um, I suppose, is there anything you think you thought could have been in the bill that isn't there that it would be worth looking at? And, again, without opening a hotel in the a yes or no would do. I mean, you did mention floating charges. Would that be an area for partnerships to look at? Is that something that would be worth looking at? Or are we better just to leave as is? I was just going to say, it's obviously, it's clearly an area of law that's very complex. So one always cautions against trying to kind of introduce something very, very complicated. I mean, because this has taken years. I mean, the Law Commission had been working on this for a long, long time. I mean, I certainly think some of the suggestions that my colleagues have made in, in relation to technical aspects hopefully can be taken on board by this committee. You know, I can see absolutely the value in that. Um, and I can see the value in the bill itself with respect to business to business, uh, but not consumers. I think um, in terms of, of the floating charge, there's an argument that this will actually make the floating charge 
potentially less popular. It probably won't, but there's an argument it might do, which is somebody who's just edited a book on the floating charge is rather frustrating. Um, <laughs> but um, nevertheless, I, I think that it's possibly worthwhile thinking this as the functional replacement for floating charges in a business-to-business -business context. And what that will mean is a floating charge should become less fundamentally important to Scottish corporate finance as it is at the moment, and more a sweep-up like they have in England as part of the insolvency processes. I would say as well, noting uh, Mr Davies' point, that this has taken a long time. It's now five years since the Scottish Law Commission Bill was published, five years before that since the initial discussion paper. I think there is a risk that the perfect is the enemy of the good. We obviously have major issues here to protect against consumers being the, the primary one, um, to, to protect them adequately. Um, but in terms of more practical operations, I think there's an argument to have a slightly iterative process where we get it on the books and then work out how, how to smooth it out once, once it's launched. Yeah, just the shares, I think, which we discussed. Thank you, Camino. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, gents, before we close, are there any final comments that uh, you would like to highlight? We'll start with seven. First, Mr Daly. Uh, it's very comprehensive, Camino. Okay. Thank you. And Dr Harden? Just the Law Society of Scotland appreciates the opportunity to provide evidence, and thank you very much for hearing for us. Thank you. As, as indeed do I. Nothing, nothing, nothing to add in my part. OK, thank you. So with that, can I thank Mike Daly, now Dr Hardman and Dr Patrick for their help this morning. The committee may follow up by letter. I know there's one or two points uh, thus far, but they might, uh, we might want to do uh, another letter uh, with any additional questions stemming from today's meeting. So with that, uh, once again, thank you very much. And I will now suspend the meeting briefly to allow the change of panel and a five-minute come for a break. Thank you.
For our second panel, can I welcome Miles Fitt, who is the Strategic Lead for Financial Health at Citizens Advice Scotland, and Alan McIntosh, who is an approved money advisor at Advice Talks Limited. Can I, I again remind our witnesses that not to worry about switching on your microphones, because that will be done by broadcasting. And also, if you would like to come in on any question, please just raise your hand. So with that, I'll just start off some uh, questions uh, before we go into colleagues. Um, so first of all, um, just on the submission from Citizens Advice, um, I, I noticed that uh, there's quite a lot of reference to the, uh, the cost of living uh, crisis, which clearly uh, we are living in uh, at the moment. Um, but uh, the bill, uh, as proposed in the financial memorandum, uh, indicates that the, if the bill uh, obviously is passed, then it wouldn't be introduced until 2024. So certainly with some of the, the, the commentary from Citizens Advice, and that clearly appears to be focused upon the present day as compared to uh, certainly I think we would all hope by 2024 that we're not in the current uh, cost of living uh, situation. Would you accept that, uh, Miles? I, I think um, the cost of living crisis could carry on for quite some time. Um, I don't think anyone's got a crystal ball as to when that's going to end. So we think that this bill, even in happier economic times, um, isn't necessarily the right thing for consumers um, because of the of what it brings and the risks it brings to the consumers. Um, but in economic difficult times, this is this is uh, made even worse having a, a bill like this that brings consumers into the equation. Um, can I just um, maybe say um, I'd like to set the scene if I can um, on where we are um, with this. Um, and so um, I'm going to read something out because I want to make it get me you know crystal clear. Um, to the committee, um, and it may help as we proceed with the rest of the rest of this, the, the discussion. Um, so I'm going to outline the, outline the view of Citizens Advice Scotland, but I know this is supported by many in the debt advice sector. But well, essentially, we do support this bill um, in terms of it being for businesses, um, but not for consumers. We see the need for business to have this legislation, but we don't see the need for consumers. We do not understand what the policy gap is that the bill is trying to fill for consumers. And at best, we think this bill is unne unnecessary for consumers, and at worst, we think it's harmful. We believe the bill runs a great risk of creating an unintended consumer harm for several reasons. First, it opens up a new route by which consumers can borrow what I guess assets they need and may lose, and which may lead to debt should they be unable to, to repay that loan. Secondly, it allows consumers to borrow, I guess, assets they would like to purchase, but may not need or have the ability to repay. Um, thirdly, and most importantly for us, and it's been mentioned earlier on in the session, it will, it will attract high-cost lenders to target vulnerable consumers who are unable to access mainstream lending, or people who are simply seduced by the effective marketing of such lenders. Do not underestimate how effective the market, marketing is from these high-cost high lenders, and they will be much better at it than the marketing from any mainstream um, lower-cost lender. And fourthly, and this is absolutely critical, and again, it was touched on earlier on, these high-cost lenders will create a product that is beyond the reach of the F FCA regulation, and that is a critical point. Um, and that will lead to years of vulnerable groups getting into financial difficulty <coughs> until the FCA catches up with it. So buy now, pay later is a good example of it. Um, there are no protections in this bill for that scenario, where there's an unreg unregulated product by high-cost lenders that target vulnerable people. Um, and we think that's a critical weakness within this bill. And finally, um, the definition of vulnerable consumer has widened. It's not a narrow um, segment. If you're out looking at the cost of living crisis, um, there are more people who are falling into financial difficulty. Um, you, traditionally, what we're having is people who are in debt, getting more into debt. You've got people who are just about managing, who are now getting into much more financial difficulty. You're also getting a, an additional group who are you could say are comfortably off are starting to get into some financial difficulty. So this idea of vulnerable people is quite a, a wider group than it maybe traditionally has been, which is going to be a problem for high-cost lenders targeting su such a group. So as a consumer organisation, we don't believe um, the consumers have any place in this bill um, and we should be removed from it. We think consumer need and behaviour is very different from business need, need and behaviour. And our position here is very wide and very strong support from the money advice sector, including Step Change, Money Advice Scotland, Christians Against Poverty, Money Advice Trust, and from the great many money advisors that we've spoken to over the last um, 
um, several months. So we think removing the consumers from the bill would alleviate all the concerns of the unintended consumer detriment while achieving the bill's main aim of making the law more modern and less restrictive for businesses. So um, I'm pleased to be able to say that to you and hopefully that helps frame discussions. Okay, no, thank you uh, for that. Uh, so just, um, just on that, the, um, the concerns that you've raised uh, there, but also in the written submission, uh, were they raised directly with uh, SLC when, um, when they were going through the process and also when they uh, produced their draft bill uh, a number of years ago? Uh, did the citizens' advice uh, contact the SLC to raise the concerns? So I think you, may, you raise an interesting point about engagement in this entire process and, and this entire subject from going back 10 years from the start. I did a bit of homework on this. There were 67 opportunities for organisations to engage or 67 examples or moments where there was engagement by stakeholders. Only one was from a consumer organisation. That happened to be Citizens by Scotland um, a couple of years ago, and that was in relation to the Economy Committee inquiry. Um, the rest were all um, <clears throat> academics, um, lawyers, legal firms, um, or financial um, uh, industry representatives. So we have an um, issue around this, around the fact that organisations that represent the consumer or the money advice sector have barely been involved. And now this issue has come as a, a bill that's been presented, now you're seeing lots more interest, which is explains why it's kind of like, you know, grown into a bit of an issue now than it has done um, later. So yes, we did um, get, get engaged a couple of years ago um, and, uh, and we put forward the view that um, consumers shouldn't be in the bill. OK, yep. thanks. Um, certainly, in terms of uh, both, uh, both of your, your organisations, uh, you've ar argued that the statutory pledge provisions uh, could open up a high-cost credit market, and you just touched upon that, Miles, uh, targeting vulnerable customers. Uh, why do you think this is likely, and uh, what would be the potential impact on the people who become your clients? Mr McIntosh. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, well, I think you know, we can look at make comparative studies with different uh, legal systems. We can look at New Zealand, we can look at America, we can look at Canada. But we don't really need to look that far. Uh, we're, all, we're already part of a single financial market, which includes the whole of the UK. So at the moment, I would say uh, there's a lot of these types of companies that would uh, give these kinds of loans already swimming about. Sharks, I would maybe use an expression, there's a lot of these kind of sharks swimming about in that market already. Uh, the reason they don't come north very much is because the waters up here are quite interpreted to them. They're a bit colder towards their business model. And I think if we were to create this statutory pledge, uh, which is proposed, which is equivalent roughly of the English bills of sale, then I think uh, it won't take long for some of those sharks, those, those predatory companies, to start swimming north into the Scottish market. They won't need to get any further regulated uh, permissions because they're already authorised with FCA. And the only thing that's really stopping them moving into the Scottish market at the moment is because uh, you know we don't have the bills of sales or some, something similar to statutory pledges. So I think that's the danger. The danger is, is that if we uh, create the environment that is uh, you know, optimum for these companies to start moving into the Scottish market, they will. And we, we don't need to really look far as well to understand uh, you know, what the effect to this is, because Citizens Advice, obviously Citizens Advice Scotland's uh, partner organisation in England, has already done a lot of work into bills of sales in these, this, these companies and what the effects they, they have on people. So, you know, they, when they talk about these sort of... And a lot of times in England, when they talk about these types of securities, they don't call them bills of sales, they call them logbook loans, because that's effectively what they are. It's a logbook loan security, and you speak to English advisors, they'll talk about a logbook loan security, and you know, that's really a bill of sales. So that's why what we're saying is we, we, what we, we believe we understand how these bills, are going, these securities are going to be used in Scotland once this law has changed, because we already know how they've been used in England. Um, and, you know, as soon as we create that environment, it's possible for these companies to operate a bit more easily in Scotland than they believe that they'll come in. So a lot of the, the other sort of expression things that have been found with these companies is it's related to these types of securities. It's, you know, it's about mis-selling, it's about consumer detriment, uh, and that, that's the experience. And I think the English Law Commission, when they actually did their investigation into bills to sales, uh, that, that was uh, the fi their findings, basically. You know, that, uh, it's a product that... You know, as it's a product that's used against people who are vulnerable. It's a product, in the consumer context, it's a product that's used against people who are vulnerable. It's used against people who can't access credit any other way. 
that would probably be better going to the local citizens advice bureau or the local council because there's probably other types of assistance available to them, such as the Scottish Welfare Fund, or there might be debt solutions available at the debt arrangement scheme in bankruptcy. And that's another thing that these types of you know these types of securities need to bear in mind. A lot of the time, times the people that actually take these securities out, this is their last resort, right? So this is after they've had the credit cards and the loans and everything else, and they can't get the credit rating has been damaged and they can't get credit anywhere else. Then they would maybe go and take a, 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 a statutory pledge security because that's the only credit they're going to get. And I've seen this to Mike Daly when I was coming here today in the train. I said, oh, I'm actually one of the few people in Scotland that probably still own their car because the vast majority of people have got car and finance these days. But I said, I, I could raise finance for my car tomorrow. But why would I do that? I mean, I would need to be basically, uh, you know, basically that, you know, totally incapable of getting credit any other way before I would ever go and raise security on my car, because it's, I'm going to pay that free 400% interest, because that, that's what that market is. Uh, so I think, and the problem with that is, is when these people take these securities out, if they then you know, go to the local Citizens Advice Bureau or Money Advice Centre to try and get help, then this creates a problem, because uh, you know at the moment we could maybe put one of those debts in the debt arrangement scheme, or we could put them in a bankruptcy. But the problem is, once there's a security is put on one of these, uh, you know, if somebody takes that security for one of these debts, if you put that debt in that bankruptcy, they'll repossess the car. If you put that debt in the debt arrangement scheme, they'll repossess the car. So the reality is, it actually creates problems for money advice services. If we see more people taking this types of debt, so even when they come to money advice centres to try and get help, we will struggle to help them because these types of securities, they give the creditors a preference. So I, I would really urge, and I support what Miles said, I support what Miles, uh, Mike Daly said, and also that the consumers are taking out this all together because I don't see any benefit. Yeah. Uh, just add to that, so you're asking um, why would high cost lenders come into this? Um, because it's what they do. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is going to be, allow people um, to um, use an asset to raise money, um, which they can't do at the moment. Um, so what you've got is the, the predators, they prey on people's instincts. So people's instinct to say, actually, I've got enough, something in the house that I can actually, you know, I know there's going to be thresholds, but that, the point is the, the, these high cost lenders prey on that whole consumer motivation about it, saying, well, there are people who actually might want to be seduced or temp tempted into getting some money um, um, on based, based on an asset. It could be the asset that they need. Um, it could be that they're doing it because they've got no other means of, of um, raising that money. They could be doing it for desperate measures. So they're preying on that, right? So that's the first thing. We see it time and again. They, they do this all the time. Um, and thankfully, um, we, what well, we've got a situation where is the, this industry, um, high-cost lending industry, is actually in decline because it's getting regulated um, and it, or some, some of the companies are going to bust, which is good. This bill will be a shot in the arm um, to, to the high-cost um, credit um, Industry because they're always waiting for the next opportunity. So we've seen it with likes of Wonga, we've seen it with you know Satsuma loans, we've done it with on doorstep lending from Provident and so on. Like they, they pop up, right? And and they will see this and they will pop up again. Um, and that is why um, it is it is dangerous. Um, and I say as well, what they'll find is they'll find a product which is beyond the reach of the FCA, right? And once they do that. This Parliament has no control over that and can't regulate that. I would have to be asking the, the, the FCA to do so. Um, and the FCA would take a few years to catch up with this. And by that time, lots more vulnerable people have been sucked into a, a, a really poor form um, of um, bor borrowing. Can I just say, Mike, Mike, this is absolutely correct. What we find in a sector is that the markets and the, create, the finance companies move a lot faster than the legislator and the regulators do. So what we end up doing is there was never a law created to create payday loans. They, took, they, they just took advantage of the opportunity. There was never a law created to create the sort of guarantor, consumer guarantor loans. They just took advantage of it. There was never a law to create the PCP market. It was existing high purchase law that had been there for 40, 50 years. There was never a law to create the buy new, pay laters. They just took advantage of it. And all that's happened over the last 10 years, as Miles will tell you, is the FCA has been chasing them. And if we make this law, because we, we know what the consequences are. We don't need to look far. We can look south of the border and we can see what the consequences are. If we introduce consumers into this for statutory pledges, we know what's going to happen, and Miles is absolutely right. The regulators are going to be chasing them, and I just think there's no why. Why would we do that? There's, because there's no real evidence. As I think Miles, Miles made the point. There's no real evidence that, that we need this. There is no evidence that we need this for consumers, for business. Absolutely, I'm, I'm prepared to support the. You know, I'm not even going to get involved in the business side. Of, maybe other than the, the sole traders, but and they have no interest in the business side. Of, but in terms of consumers, there's no evidence that we need this. This is like a. This is like an academic sort of, 
you know, it's aesthetically pleasing that there's a gap in the law in Scotland, so we need to fill that gap. That's what this is. There is no empirical evidence or research being done to show that we need this kind of security in Scotland for consumers. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't see the part the, the need for it is, is great lightweight in, in our view <coughs> about the risks and the harm that that could come for it. Um, if you were to say actually, if if it was like you know like this, this, this is a really strong need for it, and we're saying okay, there's a strong need, but there's a strong um, you know problem that may arise from it, then you're into a different debate about it. But we just don't see that there's an overwhelming need that would outweigh the risks that, that, that we are foreseeing from this. So, uh, so you're suggesting that, uh, that other stakeholders have suggested uh, that uh, the existing protections in the Consumer Credit Act and also the, via the FCA uh, are there and certainly from what you're both saying today uh, that those regulations uh, and the FCA, that they're not strong enough. To I think, I think the, the issue here is, is the type of product this is, a security right, so there's different types of products. So obviously, under the consumer credit regulations, you've got higher purchase, which is also a type of conditional sale, which is also PCP, which we use to buy a car, and that's called a quasi security. And there's quite, that's widely used in Scotland. Over 90% of all cars that are bought in Scotland are bought using higher purchase or PCP. Very few is actual owner cars now, and that's the reality of it. Uh, but you know, the, and it's. it's Bought using what's called a quasi security. And the reason it's a quasi security is because you actually never own it until you pay it off. Whereas a real security is you own it, and the, 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 but you can't really uh, sell it because that's a full security. So what this statute pledges is it's a, it's, a, it's a real security, it's a fixed security. But what's actually, we don't have that in Scotland over movable property, and that's obviously what the point of the bill is. But what we do have is quasi securities, and quasi securities are widely used, and in quasi securities, there's lots of protections for people. Uh, so and you wouldn't use, I can't, I mean, I fear it, it's possible you would use a quasi security and a fixed security, but there's no real reason. So to do a statutory pledge, which you're going to be used as a fixed sum loan, right, under the Consumer Credit Act, that's what you're going to, you're going to give somebody a fixed sum loan, and then you're going to take a statutory pledge over it. The big difference is in the higher purchase PCP quasi securities, that kind of stuff that's regulated with the Consumer Credit Act, there's a lot more protections. Um, and Mike has just Mike gave you an example of the person that sells a car, buys it, you know, basically uh, takes finance out in a car for three and a half thousand, gets out of trouble making the payments, uh, the car gets taken off him and it gets sold for five hundred pounds and he's basically maybe still left on three thousand. That was the example Mike gave. That's a fixed sum loan, right? That's, that's how a fixed sum. That's how a fixed sum loan would work with a fixed security. The person would be left without a car. Uh, maybe they get sell the car for five hundred pounds, so they would owe. So the the base story. The car's worth three and a half thousand. The finance is worth three and a half thousand. The car gets repossessed. It gets sold for five hundred. You're left with three thousand pound of debt. You don't have a car. And you got three thousand pound of debt. That's how a fixed sum loan works. The way a uh, way a higher purchase would work is you've got a. Three and a half thousand pound loan. Half of that is one thousand seven hundred, uh, sort of one one thousand seven hundred fifty. Uh, under uh, higher purchase, you have a right to voluntary surrender. So you know you're getting into trouble. You say, "I want to, I want to give this up because I know I'm, I can't pay it." You give them the car back, uh, but maybe you've uh, you've maybe paid five hundred pound off. The reality is you only owe about twelve fifty because under higher purchase, under uh, the voluntary surrender rights, you can actually hand the car back at any point and not be liable for more than half the full amount that's owed under the agreement, less what you've already paid to it. You can't do that with fixed sum loans. So the, the type of products uh, that this will be used with, and I'm that, sorry that's quite technical, but the point is the type of products this will be used with, uh, are no as, uh, no, they don't have as much protections as the type of products that are currently being used in Scotland, which is higher purchase and quasi security. They have a lot more consumer protections built into it. So you're going to create a situation where people can use uh, types of... And I think it says it in the Law Commission's report. They actually say it in the report that higher purchase higher car finance companies might prefer this type of finance. Of course they would. Do you, so it's in their interest, do you know what I mean? Because the actual higher purchase than current types of uh, products that are used offer far more protections towards consumers. It, it does nothing for consumers. Yeah. And I, I would just add on that point, and, and I'm going to be like a um, stuck record on this, is a product will be designed that's out with the FCA regulation. Right? So you can talk about all the protections you like that are in the bill. <clears throat> they won't apply to that. And, that, and that's the risk and that's the danger. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the FCA uh, has announced its intention to introduce a new consumer duty, which will make it easier to take action against harmful products. Uh, does this allay any of your concerns? 
No, I don't think so, because I think that the problem is, is actually... Uh, I mean, that, there's nothing wrong with a fixed sum loan. I mean, the fixed sum... Well, I take fixed, if I go to a bank and I take a loan, it's a fixed sum loan. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing wrong if I go to a finance company and I take a loan. It's a fixed sum loan. That's what, what, that's what the FC have. It's a, it's, a, it's a bank loan. You know, it's a, it's a finance company loan. The problem is, is we're going to give them the power to secure that. And it's this parliament that's going to keep that power to let them, these people secure that over people's movable property. And there's no need for that. There is no need for that. If I want to buy a car, if I want to get a logbook loan just now, I can pick it, take out my phone, basically, you know, I can go on the, my phone anyway. I will have the money paid into my phone by the end of the day if I want to take the finance out of my car. That's possible just now. What's going to happen, though, is that finance company is going to... They do it online, do you know what I mean? And, and they target Scottish customers, and they'll tell you you'll get paid in the same day. But the way it's going to work is what's going to happen is I'm going to sell them my car and then they're going to get my higher purchase agreement back with the protections that come with higher purchase agreement and the money's going to get into my bank account. So in England, it's just a bill of sale, so it's one transaction. In Scotland, it's two transactions, so, you know, it's, a, so it's a sale and then a, a higher purchase back. I still keep the car. I've got the money in my bank account by the end of the day. Now, I know the Law Commission says this it makes it unnecessarily complex and it's more cost involved. But that's not true, because if I can get the money for the end of the day, how complex is it? The difference is, and I accept that this bill started its life along quite well, but over 10 years ago, but the difference is, as well, no, after COVID, I can do an electronic signature on my phone. That, that's, that's costless, it, 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 you know, and it's one signature that goes on both transactions. So there is companies at the moment that will say to me, if I want to raise finance in my card, I can do that, and I can get it at the minute, and they'll get paid today. And as I say, I do it today, they say they'll pay me today. Uh, but the point is, it's, it's, just, it's two transactions. So it's basically I sell the car to them, and they basically, I keep the car, I keep possession, but I sell them the car, they become the owners, and they give me a higher purchase agreement. And if I, halfway through this finance agreement, I realise I can't afford that, I've got the right to voluntary surrender, and I can give them the car back, and I don't need to pay any more than half the total amount that's owed, less what I've already paid. If I take it, a fixed sum loan, we're in the situation Mike Dale was talking about, where they can come and take the car, they can sell the car, Offset that against how much I'm owed, but I've still got to pay the rest of the debt. That's not my interest. I would rather have a higher purchase agreement, please. OK. Yeah, uh, consumer duty is a good thing. Um, uh, the only point I'm going to add to what Alan said is, is well, it, um, <clears throat> we don't think it will cover uh, the example I'm continually giving you about um, products that are beyond the, F the reach of the FCA being created. So, good thing, but we don't think it will cover that. OK, well, thanks. Oliver. Thank you, uh, Convener. I'm just going to push it back a wee bit on the same sort of line of question asked in the previous panel, um, and I'll say the same thing to start it off. I mean, I see, uh, you know, people accessing your know, bad, you know, bad lending, you know, all the time. Um, you know, in my constituency work, I'm not kind of, you know, I, 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 it's, it's not that I think these these products are good, but when I mean, people are often in in you know desperate straits, you've said that yourself. They're at the end. You know, of, of the of, of the kind of you know safer products that they can access, and I just wonder, you know, is trying to balance that moral kind of question round, you know, why why do we think it's it's okay to let people access existing products, you know, but not this, and again the other bit is why, you know, do we 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 know there's a problem with with unregulated debt, a black market and debt, you know, people borrowing money. Um, you know, f f from, from illegally, um, do you think that there's any advantage to, to people in that very vulnerable situation to, to bring some of this into the into the open? Um, and I guess on your higher purchase example for the car, there are people you know there are people who can't access higher purchase because of their credit record. Are they not allowed to borrow at all? I mean, I, that's yeah. No. I, I mean, I just I, I, it's not my own view, but I just feel. In, in scrutinising the bill, it's to, to push back a wee bit on that and just see what you, you see. I, I think it's a very good point, and I, I don't mean yeah. for me to come in first. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, for example, um, to give an example, uh, I don't know, um, Bright House, right? Bright House, where the, 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 they did higher purchase, known the household goods. And Bright House went out of business, as we know, them into administration, and they went into administration because there's so many mis-selling claims against them, and the financial ombudsman were upholding something 80 odd percent of their claims. And the Bright, Bright, Bright House, like Provident, like Wonga, like you know, they, all, they ended up with administration basically going out of business. So that was because they were giving high purchase loan agreements to people that couldn't afford them. Uh, now, actually, so the first point is. 
whether you know there, there is action being taken against these companies because we've got the Wongers out of business, we've got the Providence out of business, we've got the Simmers out of business. Amigo, I hang on, I think they're trying to get a scheme of arrangement through the courts in England, where they'll pay a reduced dividend to the a reduced amount of compensation to the, the, the people that have claims against them. Uh, but you know, there's so many other companies like Bright House, not whole, whole, different ones that went out of business, and they went out of business because they were lending people. Uh, that based on the financial conduct authority says they shouldn't have been, or the financial ombudsman services they shouldn't have been lending to because they had bad at credit ratings, they had default notices, they knew they weren't going to be able to afford. And if you'd done enough basic affordability check, you'd have looked to these people and says you shouldn't be lending to them, right? So the point is that's who these creditors are. That's who, and a lot of them are working out of business. And I think point Mike is making is we could be creating an opportunity for these. Get, to give them a shot in the arm yeah. and create a new product when the Financial Conduct Authority spent 10 years trying to basically get them out of the market. The next issue, though, about you know, do we push people into the arms of the illegal lenders? Well, I, I remember speaking to, I think, you know, Glasgow, the, the Scottish Loan Sharks organisation, um, you know, the, the, the uh, camp, I can't remember their name, uh, anyway, but they specialise in tackling loan sharks in Scotland. And their point was that when Bright House went out of business, they thought they might see a big upsurge in sort of, or when the payday lenders went out of business, they thought they might see a big upsurge in people using payday loans, but they didn't see it. But they thought they might see it when Bright House went out of business. So the point they're making, though, is that people that take paid, uh, illegal loans out tend to be a certain type of people that are in contact with illegal lenders. Do you know what I mean? So you, you, you're seeing that just because or the payday lenders with the business didn't necessarily see a rise, didn't result in necessarily a rise in illegal loans, loan shark or increasing loan sharks. But you know, there's, there's certain types of people that might use act, be able to access that credit because you need to sort of know how to access that credit. I mean, most of us probably don't know how to access loan sharks. So I think there is a danger. But I think the danger that there is also a danger that if we, we use that argument to actually uh, not protect people and end up using uh, these these legal lenders. Uh, but, uh, but equally, you know, they're causing a lot of consumer detriment. I think the real key here is, is that there's actually a lot of help for people if they can go to a money advice centre. We can make people bankrupt, you know, we can minimise it bankruptcies, but we've got the debt arrangement scheme. We can bring people's payments down. If somebody's saying, I can't afford to pay live because you know, I'm all paying £600 a month to my month in debts, uh, £600 pound a month to my debt, so therefore I'm going to have to go and borrow more money this month to own my car, to pay my rent. The point is, if they were the Citizens Advice Bureau, they could maybe get a debt arrangement scheme, and maybe they're only paying two hundred pound a month to their debts, and their interest and charges are frozen. If they, you know, are they maybe going to a minimum asset yeah. bankruptcy, and you know, all their debts are going to be written off after six months because they're on benefits. Do you know what I mean? So there, there is. I think the key thing is if people are not suitable for borrowing, then we need to get them to the help. Also, there's things like the Scottish Welfare Fund, there's crisis grants, there's you know there's uh, fuel banks and stuff. There's other things that we can do to help people. And I think the danger is, is that as Miles said, it's all about marketing. These people, these companies, these high-cost predatory lenders will target vulnerable people whose interests we could probably be better helping better if we could get them to advice agencies or get them to the local authority where we could maybe access uh, like grants and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, can I can I add in? Right. Is, that, is that okay? Can I just add in? Um, I suppose that the question for us is that who's, who's going to use this option? We're not convinced who's going to use this option of, of using an asset to, um, to secure lending on. Because we... See, I, I, would, I don't want to interrupt you, but I mean, obviously that already happens with, with pawnbroking. It's just that people have to give the asset away. And, that's the and they're not able to use it, but you think that that's better. And that's the, and th that's the, that's the key difference. Because the, the key difference here is that the person gets to keep something that they're arguably needing. When you put something in a pawn, you probably don't need use of it. Um, um, and, it, and you don't still have it. So the temptation from a cons consumer perspective is that you're going to get to keep the thing that you're securing a, a loan on um, and, um, and get that money that, you, you know, that you're looking for, but you still have uh, the ability to use it. Now, that, that opens up a consumer behaviour of going, this, isn't, this, is, you know, this, is temp this is tempting. A point I was just going to make was, if, if you're someone who can um, go down this route, the chances are you can go down the route of borrowing unsecured as well. So why would you choose, if you can borrow unsecured, why would you attach it to something that you need? Who's this for? I'm not convinced, we're not convinced, that, and we don't want to, often maybe have to see it in practice, mm -hmm. but someone borrowing from a mainstream bank, yes, there might be a lower cost of um, uh, off the lending, but why would you do that when you've got other options? So the question for us is, who's this for? What's it going to turn into in reality? And it would be for people who cannot access mainstream um, 
uh, lending, and that takes us back into that high cost. Yeah, I would just add, mainstream lenders are not going to touch this. They don't touch it in England, they're not touching it in Scotland. So any suggestion that mainstream lenders might get into this? And the reason why is because if you need this kind of security of movable property, you probably are not going to pass an affordability test and you probably shouldn't be getting a loan in, first, in the first place. And mainstream lenders, respectable lenders, are not going to touch this for that reason, because they're not going to lend to these people, because they're not going to lend to them, because it's not affordable. It's not because they, they want the security, and that's not going to change it. The people that are going to use these are the people that are basically making mis-selling loans to people that can't afford it. No, thank you. I think it's helpful to have that on the record. The one thing I'm mean, not asking you to come back on it, but I mean, people, people do pawn things that they do need because they're desperate. So I, mean, I think it just, yeah. you know, people, people, you know, I, I just, I, it, I just think it is that, that, that there's a question just round. You know, what's best, but you've been very clear that you think this is the wrong, the sort of wrong approach. Um, yeah. So, it was just to ask on um, some other questions on on assignation uh, quickly. It's, it's sort of come up in the first session, uh, and I know it's come back <coughs> in some of the responses we've had. But I wondered how you felt um, in relation to to intimation, um, you know, and, and whether how the bill's currently uh, set out cause, causes you concern. Uh, in terms of, of, of notification, particularly? Yeah, it, we, we believe that the debtor should be notified. It's as simple as that. Um, we want them to continue to be notified. Um, we don't have any necessary issues with anything else. We don't want anything else necessarily changed on that front in terms of registers and so on. Um, although, in the previous session, we're suggesting there's some weaknesses in it. But look, um, um, we believe that uh, debtors should be notified. It's, I think it's morally the right thing to do. I think it's practically the, practically the right thing to do as well. So you um, think they should be notified before it yeah. goes on the register, yeah? Yeah, they should be notified. They should be notified. And um, and that lack of notification does make it difficult for um, when clients are coming to CEB service. And it's, it's all about, much of it is about identifying who people owe debts to, if it's getting passed on. Just simple notification. That's that's all, all we're asking for. You know, okay. We should keep that. No, that's, again, very clear. Um, and it doesn't offer you, I mean, again, it obviously addresses some of the concerns, but you don't think it goes far enough that consumers would be protected if they paid the wrong person? That, do you think that, that's enough, or do you think that need, provision needs to go further? Um, well, there is a, there is a, um, a mitigation in, if someone pays the wrong person that, that, you know, in good faith. Um, um, I, I just find it, I find it interesting that there are three um, mitigations, workarounds, um, that are being put forward on, off the back of like removing the intimation, and it's like, okay, well, why do you need these three workarounds when just just don't remove intimation, like intimate? Like that, that will go some way to have to then find other ways in which you have to clear up the confusion or problems that come from that. So it doesn't make sense to me. And um, what about the point we heard? I'm mean, just you heard the previous panel's evidence. Is that you heard, heard the first session? Yeah, bits bits of it. Of it, yeah. Um, the, just this thing around co the confusion it causes people to, you know, if the, yeah. in, in terms of paying, if they find the person's changed, I like think we heard in relation to student rent and and things like that. Is it, do you think do you think that's a yeah. valid yeah. argument that actually finding out can confuse people about who they have to pay and how they have to pay? And um, it is a recipe for confusion if you don't tell the if you're not telling the debtor and, and, and you don't have a um, a reg reg register which is fully, you know fully. Comprehensive, so like, the two things work together. Like you know, well, it's a system of the registration which is as good as it can be, but also intimate right. as well. And that way, you cover. Yeah, cover I mean, almost the point. I mean, I don't I'm worry about kind of mischaracterising what was said, but mm -hmm. what I heard from the previous point was actually, you know, if, if, if you're like in a student block of flats and you're paying money, I mean, actually, it's it, it can it's easier for you not to know that the. That, that the person you owe money to has changed, you know, as long as you can, as long as you have the account details to pay it into, it doesn't, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's actually easier for you not to get a notification every time, you know, the, 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 the future debt sort of changes hands. Is that, do you think that's right? Or are you saying very firmly that's wrong? I think it's in the best interest of the debtor to be notified every, every single time. And that way they have, um, they have that, that responsibility that they know um, and when they are being helped by the Citizens Advice Bureau, then they have a, at least it's fair on those who have done the notifying to say we've notified, um, and then they may have an idea about who they've, who has now got the debt, and that allows the problem to be 
easier fixed um, from a from an advisor perspective. So, if I can maybe, example, just uh, picking up. Is, I mean, one of the problems we've got is money advice. Is like, for example, the debt arrangement scheme. We've got to notify the creditors, you know, and give them offers and confirm the balances that are owed to them. So, obviously, if we don't know who the creditors are, then how do we make them an offer? So money advisors need to know who the creditor is because they need to be able to say this is the offer, which and you've got three weeks to respond to that, and if you don't respond to that within three weeks, you're deemed to consent to that offer. So a citizen's advice bureau money advisor who does the debt arrangement scheme needs to know who they're making the offer to. Because otherwise, how can they I mean otherwise be about sending the offer to somebody who no longer owns the debt? And how can they respond to say whether they accept the repayment plan? Yep. Yep. No, thank you. I mean, that's a good, solid example for us to pursue further. Uh, so thank you. And that's good thank you. Um, Bill Kidd. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much for your information so far, panel. Um, Ungoff, you've answered quite a few things that I was going to ask anyway. Um, so I'm going off at just a wee bit of a tangent from what we've been on so far. Can I ask you, it was more about um, uh, businesses and, uh, and the communities. Um, do you think the proposals in the bill as presented should apply equally to all businesses or should there be additional protections for small traders and small businesses? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a lot. Of, obviously, in terms of limited companies and partnerships, I probably don't have... Um, I think there's got a cut-off line, you know, but obviously, but uh, I don't have a lot of opinions. But in terms of sole traders, I do have, I do have concerns. And I, I accept the point, you know, that the previous... Uh, uh, witnesses you know, they made a point about maybe the farmer who has got maybe valuable stock, uh, for example, and he wants to put a fixed security over it, and obviously he may still be trading as a sole trader. So I accept that point, and I think Mike Daly made that point that that, that is possible. But on top, the other side of it is you've got the delivery driver or you've got the Uber driver and stuff like that. Um, so I suppose the, what is a sole trader? Uh, I think one of the things, and I think I want to just touch on the point Mike Daly made is. Obviously, the problem, one of the issues with this bill, though, is, is that uh, the sole trader or the, in this, this bill doesn't have the same protections as the consumer does, so they don't, therefore, no court orders required to actually go and seize the goods, basically, to, you know, to and put them up for sale. Uh, and I think that is, although I want to see consumers taking out this bill, if no sole traders are left in, I think that has to be mandatory that, that, that they still have to get a court order. And if I can touch on one other point that Mike made, and that was in reference to the common law position in Scotland. Uh, there is a common law position in Scotland, you know, that I think it was one of the institutional writers of Erskine or I can't Bell or something like that, you know. And this is uh, that basically says that, you know, um that the Scottish courts don't like self help remedies. They do not like credit self using self help remedies. And if somebody tries to use a self help remedy, like come just take your good you no know, take possession of something for a court order, then you, you know, you're actually allowed to defend it. Use the defence and that's why under uh, Mike pointed out, under the, high, the under the Consumer Credit Act, it actually says unless the goods one third of the goods will be paid, it's an unprotected good, and the lender can come and take it without a court order. That's what the Consumer Credit Act says. But if you look at every single Consumer Credit Agreement in terms of higher purchase, it will say in brackets after that point, except in Scotland, where we, you all, you may, we may always need a court order. If you speak to any consumer credit lawyer in Scotland, they'll tell you you always need a court order in Scotland. Because and the reason for it is because if you look back at the obviously the common law and institutional writers, the Scot Scottish courts do not like self-help remedies. So they, they, you know, if you, somebody tries to come and take possession of your goods without a court order, you're entitled to use the self-defence to protect the goods. The point being is this act allows them to come and take your goods without a court order. And so I think it is actually a serious point here that uh, Mike touched on. And it was the only one I was sitting there I was thinking about it, and I think that's true because at the moment uh, there would be a court order. That would be the common law position if we create another piece of legislation that says they can come and get the goods before a court order. Then I think we're diminishing the rights of sole traders. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, we don't have too much to say on that. You know, we're looking at this from a consumer perspective yeah. and the consumer element in the, in the bill. Um, so clearly, we've said that we think that what's being applied for business is good. But, yeah, there is an issue maybe around sole traders and, and weather, but we don't have too much to, to add to that. Sorry. No, no, that's, no that's, that's fair enough. And thank you very much for, for that. And thanks, Mr McIntosh, for the outline as well. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you. And Jeremy. Uh, and good morning. I, I understand, you know, absolutely your position is consumers should be taken out. And, and that, that's very clear. But just in regard to our scrutiny, and just in case... 
the Parliament doesn't go with you in regard to that. Just a couple of follow-up questions in regard to if it, you know if consumers are left in, and particularly around the register. Um, do you have concerns as money advisors about who can access the register and what information, is there enough information in the register to then you, for you to be able to help your clients? Alan, you're the money, yeah, you're the money advisor. Uh, OK. Uh, I suppose for, uh, uh, there is ways of doing this. I mean, for example, if you look at the register of statutory moratoriums, which is a uh, register, public register operated with account and bankruptcy, you can, as a public register, you can search it. And that, the thing about a public register is it has to be searchable, obviously, otherwise, what's the point of having it? But it is searchable, the register of statutory moratoriums, but you can only search it if you know somebody's uh, first name, their second name and their date of birth. I think it's a postcode, actually, and you need a postcode. So if you, unless you know, you know, if I was looking for Paul Sweeney, I'd need to know, I couldn't just type Paul Sweeney in, I need Paul Sweeney's data postcode as well, and that way I can actually find him. So there is probably ways that you can probably add in extra protections to make it harder to search, you know, for somebody just to troll through, you know, and go up this, you know, go, go, troll through it and basically just search their whole, all their neighbours, basically. Well, maybe they could if they had the postcode. But you know, the, the idea there is probably ways, and the reason for that is, is because uh, you know there was issues about people trolling the statute register, the register of statute moratoriums in Scotland, and so the AIB put these additional protections in. But I, I think the point about a, stat, a public register is it has to be searchable. You have to be able to find people in it, um, and so. But I think there is maybe lessons that could be learned by looking at that and the experiences of accounting and bankruptcy to try and protect people. But you also tend to find this is true as well for the register of insolvencies. It's not really people that there's no people don't tend to go and search these things unless they've got a reason to. Yeah, I, I think I add, it should be free of charge for to do the search. Yeah, yep. Which I think at the moment it's not meant to be. I think it's a, is that a twenty pound charge for a suggestion? I think was. So you think? Sure, but yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's for the individual who's um, who's in debt who needs to maybe go and search it, um, or indeed the um, the, the, the advisor. Um, having to search it as well on their behalf, so it should, it should be free of charge. And just a very practical term, then you would think that fee should then be covered by Scottish Government. So the register would Co be covered by someone, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm the point. I mean, if it's, if it's not going to be a fee, yeah. you know, obviously people are there to be employed, yeah. but 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 you know, it wouldn't be done by anyone else, it would be done by it would be a government agency which would be funded by the government. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and obviously, they could charge the creditors for a, a fee, administrative fee, for putting a uh, register. You know that that could be a way of recovering the cost, so the creditors pay for it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. So, Bill. Yes. Um, right, sorry to, um, to come back, but uh, I think you might have covered this um, earlier. But there's a general agreement about the thousand pound threshold in the bill. Um, now, obviously. That has been in place for quite a while, um, and uh, I've heard a few people say certain numbers. And last week, I believe three thousand pound was mentioned, etc. Um, but uh, it's going to be updated to some degree. But do you know? Have you got an idea or a clue as to what the best direction that this could go in would might be? At all? Uh, good, good question. Um, so I, I think what, if consumers don't commit the bill. Then, yes, they don't. Yes, yeah. Right. Let's what on the basis they don't. Then, um, you are then looking to uh, build in as many protections and mitigations as possible, and we would be looking at as, uh, as many things as possible. So uh, we're kind of looking at that as a second stage to see because there's probably many other things to look at as well. It could be done. However, uh, on on the point of the of the sum, it's, yeah, three thousand, five five thousand. Um, but what you get into is. Um, something whereby you know the more you increase it, and yes, you do protect all household items, and fair enough. But you know this is going to come down to cars at the end of the day, mm. right? Whose value is going to be, you know, upwards of maybe five thousand, four thousand, or higher. You know, and what do you do? Do you tick up to twelve thousand to, to to that? But then if you take up to twelve thousand, you might as well just remove consumers from the bill because that's just going to take so so much so much out of it that there's no point. So. Um, that was something we would certainly come back, come back to at a point of going, well, what, what should it be? And I think there should be a discussion about that. Yeah. Oh, it should be. oh, I would add to that. It's the 3,000 figures actually comes for 2010, which was actually when the Home and Debt Protection mm -hmm. Scotland Act went through mm -hmm. and what it basically did, it was Fergus Ewan and increased the minimum protection for a car, which was a reasonable requirement for, from an attack, in terms of being attached in the law of diligence, went from 1,000 to 3,000. So it's actually stayed at 3,000 uh, since 2010 and 11. Uh, 
So, you know, obviously, an obvious thing would be to link that. I think that's currently getting consulted on with accounting bankruptcy at the moment for the bankruptcy and uh, diligence bill that's actually, I think, planned for this, this parliament this, this term. But there's an obviously a problem here as well. And if we can look at even wage estimates, for, there's an example of this. Wage estimate legislation gets upgraded. Up, um, the amount that you know, is protected in wage estimates and bank account estimates is up, updated every three years uh, by whatever the, the average rate of inflation has been over those three years. And did we not half get caught out this year? Do you know what I mean? Because we just updated it in the April there, and it looked at the last three years' levels of inflation. And obviously, inflation has you know, obviously massively uh, went up since then. So the point, I think, is even if you, you link it to something and up, get, update it every so often, you can get caught out. Because as we've seen with the, the diligence against earnings and bank investment legislation, which is new, well, that the bank investments have just been upgraded, but the diligence against earnings uh, that that you know, it looked at the last three years about the, the average wage rate of inflation is so, and I think cars in value have actually suddenly recently went up in value as well. You know, the second-hand car market is quite strong at the minute after coming out of COVID. So there's been, a, you know, for years, you know, it was quite flat, and then it's suddenly went up. So, so the thing is, it's it's try to find the right figure. It's hard because it fluctuates constantly, and there's a lot of different factors. Yeah, uh, it, yeah just um, the idea. I mean, the thousand-pound threshold. Um, that was uh, that's been broached. Everybody is pretty much of the opinion that it needs to be higher than yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and but I think possibly the more important element, and I think you've mentioned that, is not so much where it starts, though it's got to be higher than a thousand. Yeah. Um, is how it increases yeah. over time. Then actually, mm -hmm. that's really what an important element is. You know, so it's useful to have heard yeah. that. Thank you very and, much. And one other thing I would just add is, I mean, another example. And again, I, I'd rather just consumers just commit the bill. To be honest, that just makes it easier. But for example, if I put somebody into the debt arrangement scheme and they've got one of these securities, well, the problem is uh, they can still repossess the car. So I'm not going to work put this this debt into the debt arrangement scheme because they're going to lose their car. And they lose their car, they can't go to work, they can't pay their debts and all that stuff. So it creates a problem. So at the moment, you know, the, the debt arrangement scheme wouldn't prevent the car being repossessed. So maybe if we did include consumers, then there'd need to be something in the, the bill to say that if uh, if the debt was included in the debt arrangement scheme, the, the security couldn't be uh, the security be, couldn't be uh, called up effectively. Basically, the be the car the item that so the debt would go in, but they wouldn't be able to use the security because at the end of the day the debt's went out of the debt arrangement. So it'd be about putting an additional level of protection into the debt arrangement scheme. Uh, similar to what Mike was talking about in time to pay directions and stuff, it's about well, allowing people to keep possession while they reschedule their debts. Something like that might have to be necessary. But I'd rather just the, the council make it. It makes it simpler. Yeah. And because fundamentally, at the bottom line is we don't see the need for this at all. That's that's the thing. If we if we genuinely saw a need for this, I think we'd be we'd be trying to work in terms of how do we make it fairer. But we don't see the need for it. Okay. Can, can I come on the back of the of, of the need? Can I, I just add in? It says something about. Um, is um, it would be good to see evidence of the work carried out by the Scottish Government or the Work Commission on the impact of this bill on consumers, um, why they think high-cost lenders wouldn't enter the market, um, why a new form of statutory pledge is actually needed for consumers, is there an overwhelming argument that, that we're, we're not seeing, um, uh, and why it believes that mainstream lenders will definitely um, into this market with low-cost loans. So um, it would be good when you get the chance to speak to the officials uh, to put those questions to them. It's useful direction. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul Sweeney. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you to Mr Fit and Mr McIntosh for coming in and offering such helpful uh, contributions so far. Um, mindful, again, of your overall position regarding consumers being removed from the proposed bill, um, looking around the enforcement implications um, in particular, I know there's been concerns raised in written uh, correspondence around the fact that you know people could agree not to be subject to a court order to recover um, goods with a security attached, or what arguments they would be able to offer in defence in court um, against um, a move against them by um, a creditor. So, in mindful of those issues, um, what or do you think the processes in the bill are? sufficient to protect consumers and do you think the enforcement issues do present concerns? I think, yeah, I think there is problems, like, you know, as, as Mike pointed out, under the Debt of Scotland Act, you can apply for a time to pay direction or a time to pay order, but, uh, but the problem with that, well, it'd be a time to pay direction, because that's what you apply for when it gets brought to court, but the problem with that is it's still, 
it doesn't prevent the. It basically still means you get a court order against you. It's just an instalment decree, and the lender can still call up the security, which basically is take the car. So I think you would maybe we could look at uh, again. I'd rather just take the consumer out, obviously. But you know there are things that we could do. Like, for example, in Scotland, we can use statutory moratoriums, which basically you know currently would prevent a sheriff officer from arresting your uh, wages or freezing your bank account or attaching your car. You know, but you know we could extend the the the, offer, the, the powers and the statutory moratoriums to mean that they couldn't take you to court or call up a security. Uh, while you seek advice, and you know you get at the moment it's six months, so you would get six months to go to speak to. A citizens advice bureau or local uh, so there are, there's probably additional protections that we could put in there uh, and also as i say we could look at maybe uh legislating but we obviously need to come back on that but we could probably look at uh, if there is devices um that could be used to sort of protect the consumer you know to allow them to pay the debt off and keep possession the key thing is people want to keep possession because you know it's something that they probably can't do without as michael said uh they've probably Taking this, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have gave it to a pawnbroker because they wouldn't have been able to, you know, they couldn't have, they couldn't have, uh, you know, given it up. You know what I mean? But they've kept possession, and that's what's let them do this. So, uh, the key thing, any any sort of protections that we do have, to, if we were to introduce some, they have to allow the person to keep possession because that's the key point. They need the goods, and otherwise, that's where the real detriment arises. Yeah, yeah. On top of the debt. Yeah, I, I, no, I agree. I mean, it's, the critical difference in all this is that people are getting to keep the items, right? Yeah. And, and that, and that's. Um, and for some people, um, the, the need to keep the item may not be as strong as for others. For others, will need that item. It could be essential items that they're using. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it probably will be based around the car. Um, and that's that's the issue. I mean, the the process of enforcement. I, I mean, it's broadly it kind of makes sense. Yeah, if you've got quite something on a secu security that you need to that have a means to get that back, and someone's gone into that by saying, okay, I'm going to use, but but. But there, there's usually other measures in between times to, before you get to that point to get mm. the support and, yeah. and time to pay and, and all the rest of it. Um, but it, it, and, and I think that's more per pertinent because it may well be something that that individual absolutely essentially needs and then there'd be a further detriment. So do everything we can to help them. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I think it also carries over to the point about sole traders. You know, if you remove the means by which they can earn money to service the debt, then you're compounding the yeah. problem, not solving it, and yeah. there isn't really a public interest in that happening. So, yeah, yeah. And, and it's also yeah. about you know we've also got to remember here when we remove somebody's ability to actually uh, earn a living, whether that's a consumer or a sole trader, because of detriment to other creditors who may be getting that living, maybe paying their debts as well. So there's, this is the danger, because what you have is a subprime lender who's maybe learned irresponsibly, has now got this strong position where they can go and take the car. They go and take the car to enforce their position. And as a result of that, you know, the responsible lenders, the credit unions, uh, or the, the housing association who's waiting for their rent to be paid, or the local authority has been waiting to you know, to get their council tax. They've, they're suffering a detriment here as well because this person suddenly doesn't have a way of making their living and maybe is starting to default on their debt. So it's that sort of de de that con contagion, do you know what I mean, spreading. And that's, mm. that's the danger here. And this is why irresponsible lending is really, really, uh, it causes a lot of detriment, not just to the consumer, but it can cause detriment. And you know, this is why a lot of the time, as money advisors will tell you, we end up, we end up making people bankrupt mm. because, and then it affects all the creditors because. It just gets to a situation where you go, well, there's only a solution left. Mm. Well, I think I'll rest on that. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Jeremy, I think you wanted back in. Are you fine? Okay, no. Bill? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Yourself. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, just the kind of one final question from myself. Um, I know some of this has been touched upon, but other than what has been discussed, uh, today, uh, and also your position is very clear in terms of uh, consumers uh, for that to be to come out of the bill. Um, is there anything else that you would like to see actually in the bill? I know also you touched upon the statutory moratoriums to the Paul's question. Is there anything else you would like to see in the bill? No, I think um, no. Only, only what I would not like to see in the bill. But I've already said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's more about what we don't want to see in the bill. Um, um, but then once we. Uh, you know, we can't foresee at this point whether consumers will or not come out. And then, if they don't come out, then that puts us in a different ballpark where we need to then work out what we would then say about well, what then then needs to happen. So, so there may be some some things we might want to see in if consumers don't come out. But we're concentrating on getting consumers out of the spill mm. at this point. Okay, okay. 
Uh, are there any particular comments, any final comments you would like to, uh, to put on the record? Mm -hmm. No, and I, I just don't want to... Um, I, 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 all I would say is that I, I respect the, the huge amount of work that the Scottish Law Commission has done, and I read the reports, and I know I don't want to be flippant and just sort of turn up in the last five minutes. I, I do think there's been an issue, but obviously uh, I think a lot of the consumer sector were blindsided because the focus has been purely on business, which I think is right, because that's what the bills are about. So we, we've been blindsided and we've turned up at the last minute and sort of gone, hold on, we've got a problem here. So, I, But I don't want to be disrespectful to the huge amount of work that the, 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 the Law Commission has done, and that has an extensive amount of work, and I've read, unfortunately, I've read it almost it now, and actually, but I, I, I just don't, I think on this bit, they've got it wrong, basically. That's it. Yeah, okay. um, and I, I would just add that um, even those who are, like, proponents of the bill, are not um, have concerns about consumers. So you had you know, evidence um, last week by um, one of the witnesses, and from uh, there was a previous member of the SLC in his submission, and indeed the, the people he had earlier on, who um, and, and I'll quote not sorry I'll not quote for the people from earlier on, but I'll quote the other two people who basically said the same thing, which was if if um, consumers. The inclusion of consumers um, is a, such a political hot potato. Then they would, well, well, slightly to keep them in would be, and I kind of paraphrase a little bit here, but it would be kind of like accepting that they would be taken out because ultimately, and they said that the bill is, is ultimately for businesses. So if we can get that fixed, that's fine. And it might be regrettable that you take consumers out, but it can be done. So even those who are advocating for the bill are kind of, go are kind of going, well, actually, you can, yeah, consumers, yeah, fine. So I think that opens up an opportunity, I think, for um, the MSPs, the Parliament, the government to actually go down that route as well. Thanks. OK, well, thank you for that. So uh, with that, uh, can I thank uh, Miles Fit and Alan McIntosh for the help this morning? And uh, as with uh, the first panel of the committee, uh, may wish to follow up with uh, further correspondence with yourselves with any additional questions uh, stemming from today's meeting. Uh, so with that, I want to suspend uh, the meeting briefly to allow the panel to leave. Uh, thank you very much. Under agenda item number three, we are considering an instrument subject to the affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on the draft Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme. Amendments number three, order 2022. Is the committee content with this instrument? Yes. Under agenda item number four, we are considering two instruments subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2022, 278 and 279. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yeah. Yeah. Under agenda item number five, we are considering an instrument not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSI 2022-280. Is the committee content with this instrument? Yeah. Yes. Uh, as I agreed earlier, I now move the meeting into private.